จะใช้ทั้งบัตรแชร์นี่น่าสนใจมากมาจากมิสซูมมาจากเนี่ยเดี๋ยวจะมีการนี่นู่นเชื่อคนชูสวัสดีสัตว์ Okay, ladies and gentlemen, sorry for the small delay, but what we are looking for is a very exciting session, so it's worth the delay. Uh, we have had unique presentations here. We have with blended history and literature, and today we have a special scholar who has research on lessons, but she's been in performance for a long time. I think she's one of the people I've known to be in performance for a long time since I joined the University of Nairobi. And she's explored many ways of performance. I know there are debates in this world now with digitality and everything else, that now we think about performance in digital space. We talk about losing one pass, uh, old man in, in Africa and losing a whole library. But it, it, it seems there are many ways that our ancestors have devised of preserving history. And today, Shai Mwangola is going to, to talk about one, one of them, unique one. And some of you, I think when you're walking around, you look at Matatus and you see some messages there. They might irritate you, they might excite you, they might jog your memory in a way that you remember about something. But also exciting is the things we see on Leso, which uh, for, for me today, we are going to enjoy the deep meaning of those messages. And Swahilis have always a way of hiding so many meanings in what they say. So perhaps we are going to discover those. Also. Please let me welcome Mshai Mwangola, so that she can talk to us and see what we will have to discover through this session. Thank you, Mushai. Thank you very much, Amel. Thank you very much, um, Mwalimu Kimingichi. It's always a joy to meet up with you again and uh, Mwalimu Gona. And let me just start first by just thanking the University of Nairobi Department of History for not just the opportunity to speak today to you, but also to have us think about the theme. And I don't know how many of you are aware of what the theme of this series is, but I found it really interesting that the theme is bringing down history and archaeology from the ivory tower. So I want to start by thinking about that. And also by bringing into the room uh, my co-conspirator, fellow scholar, who has, uh, we, we are beginning to work together, but I've known of her work for a long time. I think we've been talking about this topic for a long time. So let me start by bringing my sister. And I'm going to ask for the PowerPoint to be put up, please. Next slide. Diana Kamara into the space. Reading Kanga, exploring academia. With excitement, I pick a topic on reading Kanga as a historical source. History whom I have met a few times, seen here and there, is becoming a familiar figure. I can listen, laugh, <laughs> even ask him when he permits. But when I say I want to talk, he wants evidence. He says if he had let everybody talk, he would have died in infancy. He survives on evidence. It has to be his story. I said, Mwanamke upigwa kwa upande wa kanga. A woman is beaten by a piece of kanga. He replied, Can it be verified or revisited? It is not just 
evidence. Terms and conditions apply as well. The evidence has to be weaved into arguments. And maybe then he will listen, depending also on this patron's mood. How I'm struggling, not just with evidence and arguments, but also with objectivity. He works in the discipline office. He trains you to distance yourself from yourself. And if you try to bypass your non-academic memory and thus become a big time professor, then people can listen to that memory of that young woman. He assures you, they will then love how you turned frustration into inspiration. You will be a living monument, book after book, conference after conference, until you shake hands with the marks, hopes, and any of your favorite men of letters and historians in print. If you want to have a conversation with yourself, don't be loud and use holidays, not school time. Yet. I thought I was writing about my womanhood and the femininity and masculinity around me. Of that kanga we used as a curtain in the village house. I may not be able to speak about it now. It is the gap I have found in studies on kanga that I am supposed to focus even if the literature confines it to embodiment. As a friend recently reminded me, I claim to have come to the academy to write stories that my mother can read. Stories are for verandas, he insists. If trends are out, they will be archived. It is the new truth I have found. Objectivity says I should grow out of my mother's kanga. After revisiting postmodernism, long durée, Marxism, and all their cousins, holidays are coming. How am I going to tell my mother the story of Kanga, of my grandmother, whom I knew from her photos and somehow connected to through the Kanga? She did not feel as distant until I read that I may not also have connected in other women's magical struggles here, but also to the whole of the Swahili coast, the Indian Ocean world, and even the Dutch who produced early Kanga, I am now connected to early 19, from, to people from the late 19th century who will never reconnect with me. Academics are busy reading people as problems and reading each other as debates. I am now on that path of reading, historicizing and trying to ask the right question about Kanga. My memory is not even that of a native informant. It is that of a research assistant. Now I'm not even sure whose essay this is. Those who have felt something for Kanga and written about it, or I, who claim to be the legitimate heir apparent of Kanga stories. <laughs> and it's funny. We read Machiavelli's hopes as concrete program. And I cannot even share a bit of my memory. Or when I do, I declare almost with embarrassment that it is my own voice. And after that, we say, Sabalatan this, marginalize that. Bear with me. I am learning. I am not the minority. That term, minority, comes with political and economic or even social marginalization. I feel like to raise my voice for the sake of my memories is attempting to sail alone while others have big vessels and have accumulated the knowledge to challenge the sea. <laughs> no wonder, eh? During my holidays, a year ago, my aunt told me, you should be grateful you finished high school while some of your colleagues are dropping out pregnant. Truly, many of your peers from university are married. And don't you know how men can get when you get educated? You go and read in peace while thanking God for all he has done to you. But bring us good news before you finish. The way I see you, it will be a mzungu. These readings are probably adding to my frustration. 
This will not reach a psychiatry level because it is not under nervous conditions. The Swahili are cosmopolitan peoples where the books read. When I try speaking my parents' language, they say I am Mswahili because of my heavy accent. <laughs> There's a man eh, who was looking for some degree of belonging in relation to my parents' tribe and supposedly mine too, to propose. The interview included these prerequisites. If I could speak the higher language, cook my talking and know my clan name, given that I was born and raised in Dar es Salaam. Once, a young man from my neighborhood whistled to me. One dada told him for me too to hear. Hakaliba, a man from Masaki, Oster Bay, i.e. Uzunguni. But keko for me is Uswahilini. Our parents may speak vernacular to us, but we played in Kiswahili with friends. Listen to Radio Tanzania. English was map of primary school when all subjects were in Kiswahili. What rubs salt in my wounds is that the scholars I choose to blend with in the humanistic traditions don't have me in mind when they write about the Swahili. It is as if they turn the binoculars upside down. For them, Swahili is Muslim and patriarchal, Zanzibar and Mombasa. So here I am, hanging out with besties in Da and following a bit of trends on Insta. I'm just trying to see how I slot in the gray areas I found about Kanga while Nita is swearing at her mother that Ambindwile is not the father of Chimwemwe's baby. Yet, all along, I was reading so as to connect with my friends and our mothers and the few times we have brought each other Kanga in turns. And here I am, claiming to be a humanities, to, claiming to be in a humanities college. Mwalimu, have we imagined these humans so much that they reflect theory? Are humans in the same direction, but in different lanes, which command different road safety maintenance instructions? Or what is social about this science that will deprive me of the social life that I have longed for? the whole year. Diana Kamara, trying to figure out what it means to be a scholar working with Kanga. Thank you. You want me to keep using this? Okay. Now I, I chose to start with Diana's work and I read when I'm performing other people's works, even when I know the stuff, because I want you to know that I am drawing, this is for me research. I am bearing witness to the work that others are doing. And for me, Diana takes us right into the heart of what we want to do today. When we talk about bringing down history and archeology span from the ivory tower. Let me start by really, really, really thanking, um, I'm just putting, I'm a storyteller, so I always have to time myself. Otherwise I'll be talking you here until it is midnight and we'll just be still going. Um, I want to thank again, uh, Dr. Mbongi and the department for giving me the opportunity to share my work as a non-professional historian, even though I'm an academic. Because I think of the academy as this really special place. It's a place where you can dedicate time and resources just to thinking and to sharing and to debating. But I also think that, as Diana says, that we must think about how our work then goes down to the people who matter. If Diana is to tell stories, um, she's able to take her research and translate her research um, to her mother, to her grandmother, to her friends, then we must find ways of making that translation happen. So I'll ask for the um, next slide. So for me, when I thought about this presentation, I was really, really grateful that I don't do what I normally do when I'm doing academic presentations on this subject, but I also get to reflect on the sources we are using as we look at the history and what does it also mean to research something that is so intimate to our lives. And what you see there is not only the poster, but around there, and I'll come back to some of those, are some of the sources that I use. Yes, I draw on historical texts, I draw on documents, you'll see that, but I'm also drawing on people's own testimonies, 
on people's experiences, on a whole range of things, as you will see. Next slide. What I would like to do is just very quickly walk you through, to, hopefully we'll get to do four things. One, I want to introduce you to the research, um, the research project, where it comes out of and why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'll do that very briefly. And the reason I'm going to do this is I have been, I'm one of the people who follow this series and I not only listen when they're going on, if I'm not able to be here, but I go back and I, I listen again because I think they're so useful. And I think about a month ago, we had Wangare Grace and Ven, if you remember, and they did a performance. And there were a lot of questions about how does this performance that non-academics are doing connect with the history that we are doing. I know Kimi Ngigichi also chaired that session, so I know you're very happy that we're having that. So I'll, I'll just do some touch points I won't go into that in detail because I really want to get into the history, but raise some things, methodological issues that if people are interested in, we can come back to later. Then I'm going to still go back to that slide, please. I'll, I'll look at the project and then I'll come to the thing I'm calling the palimpsest, which is the Kanga, and hopefully we'll have some conversations. So the project that I am engaged in, and now you can go, is called Common Treasures. And the reason that I want to talk about Common Treasures is for me, as an academic, I am on a search for projects, academic projects that have three things. They are relatable to the ordinary person, they are versatile, and they are accessible. Accessible meaning that people don't ask, what is that? You know, sometimes you look at an academic, academic topic and you're even afraid to engage it. Secondly, it is something that means something to you in your everyday life. And thirdly, it must be something that you can come into it with as many perspectives as possible so that we actually can say that different people can enter this topic and be talking about their pet passions and all of us can find space in for the conversations. So that's the common treasures. Next slide. And the five things, and I'm going to go through this very quickly, the concepts that undergird my methodology are these five things, all of them taking us back into this issue. These are common because they're easy for everybody to have access to, but they're treasures because they are rich. And the particular project on Kanga is just one of them. Going back to this question of bringing down the work we do as academy down to where people are. So I'm just going to literally walk us through the slides. I won't talk to them just so that you know what the slides are. And if anyone wants, we can come back. So the next slide is performance. Actually, this one, I'll say something. Um, I am a performance scholar. The other term I use is oratorist. We use the term performance simply to mean a means by which people reflect on their current conditions. As a result of their thinking, they do something. They define themselves, they reinvent themselves and their social world and then they make a choice on how to react to it. Um, and so sometimes we use the arts, but not every performance scholar needs, uses the arts. I just want to clarify that. Next um, slide, autoethnography. This is a term I know many of you are familiar with. Um, and I love this particular definition because um, note the slash between auto and ethnography. It speaks, this is um, Deborah Reed Danahy, and it speaks of when we as trained, I want to say academics, she says anthropologists, get into a space of reclaiming the histories um, that other people have been saying about us, and we are telling our stories. And you all know the debates about objectivity, subjectivity, and you know, all the way down to when Kenyatta and Liki were fighting in the UK. The next slide is art. I use art a lot. I know there are many definitions of art. I can see Kimingichi already looking like, wait, that's not how I define it. But I define it like this because for me, I use art in research as a way of getting people to think and to talk. Next one is story. If you're a graduate student, let nobody ever tell you your dissertation work does not matter. This definition came from my dissertation research from a very close friend and also someone I work a lot with, Yvonne Adhiambo Owar. And in this particular, um, we, we were talking about the point of story. And I really wanted to bring this up because I know many of us, when we think about story, this was the big debate that we had, uh, we are historians. Stories are imagined. 
can we really trust this thing of the imagination? So for me, this is um, something that I hope we will come back to. Then the final one is orator. I define myself also as an oratorist. And if you aren't aware, orator moved on from the days we simply described it as oral literature. Now we look at orator in many, many different ways. And um, so as an academic, this is the other way I define myself. So let me move on to the next, um, so I don't take too much time. I want to talk about the actual um, presentation, the actual project. So I said there's common treasures. There are five different projects, God willing, if I live long enough to do all five. <laughs> and the first one is Lesso Conversations. And this has been interesting um, because it's taken me a long time to get to this place. I didn't even know when I started I was going into this big, amazing thing. But Lesso Conversations is the particular pro um, project Two terms, I just want to quickly introduce. Everybody knows what a lesso is, right? It's what other people call kanga, but that's what a lesso is. And then I also said that this is um, a project about Ziwaku. So if we go to the next slide, I just want to talk briefly about it. I don't want to do the performance. If we have time, I'll do a bit of performance from this. But the term Ziwaku is a term um, that Yvonne O'War has been working a lot with. Uh, in her book, The Dragonfly Sea, when she was doing the research for that, she challenged me and others of us who are working on this to ask um, with a question, what is it that um, the pe people, what is it that people on this part of the world called the ocean before the Europeans came and told us that they're looking for India? Does anybody have a name that proceeds, a name that your people call Indian, the Indian Ocean? That is not um, that is not has nothing to do with Barahindi. It's got nothing to do with India. Okay, and that was the that was the term that we wanted that that came up. Um, and you know, I'm going to take a minute and just read an excerpt from Yvonne. This is from the book, The Dragonfly Sea. Those of you who know the book, it's a it takes us back to the history very briefly. If you remember, there's a time that China China came and took a young woman. Um, from Lamu because they had traced her DNA based on archaeology. So archaeologists went out there talking about bringing them down from the ivory tower. They found a ship and on the ship it, it had sunk pretty close to Lamu Pate. And the people told them, yeah, yeah, we always knew it was there. Those people, when the sink, ship sank, we brought them on shore, they intermarried. And this is why if you go to Pate, you will find people who, you know, the thing Kenyans call Chinese eyes. And people always laughed about it and said, Ay, hadithi, 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 enjoy. that cannot be true. But the Chinese came and did DNA tests, and sure enough, they found that there was a patrilineal line to China. So they said, we're giving scholarships to anybody from that lineage who um, qualifies to go to university. And the first person to qualify was a girl, yay, from Lamu. And she went, and Yvonne based her book even before she met her on this story. So I wanna just take a minute, literally will be a minute. And this is a small section in the book, the girl. And now this is not what happened to that girl. This is Yvonne's imagination. Ayana is in class with other students. This is in China from Indian Ocean area. Yvonne O'War, Ziwaku. One hot and humid day, Ari, a student of marine engineering from India, observed that the Maritime Silk Road Initiative subsumed the Indian Ocean. He had emphasized the Indian to others. It is not for nothing the ocean was called Indian, he noted. Ayana retorted, Ziwaku? I returned, Ugubugu? Ziwaku. Ayana refused to see territory. Ari said, We'll discuss that with your good self the day your country acquires a motorboat to start a navy. Ayana said, Ziwaku, and we have a navy. Doubtless, its fish bounties are commendable, but what else? Titas. Ratnakara, said that Indonesian. Indian Ocean, emphasized Ari. Ziwaku, repeated Ayana. Indian Ocean. Two Pakistani students chimed in. Ziwaku, 
the class slipped into an uproar that did not change Chinese foreign policy. The lecturer, who was watching the disintegration of order in his class in disbelief, his face becoming blotchy, at last screamed, the Western Ocean, you are in China. Western Ocean, murmured Ayana, looking at Ari beneath her bands as she doodled the words, Ziwaku, on her notepad, thinking about Akipate toponym, her heart pleased with the meaningless skirmish she had stirred. The lecturer was shouting out his points. Ayana returned to jotting down notes of another nation's imagination for her sea. One belt, one road, she wrote. She would have to ask Muhyiddin what the different Kipate names for her sea were. And that's Yvonne O'War. Thank you. So my project began with this question. What of the... Indian Ocean is ours. Does it matter? Should it affect our foreign policy? Does it mean anything to us today? My project started in 2008, that's how long I've been working on this, with a paper called Global Conversations, Local Interactions, Kanga and Kikoi as performances of the Indian Ocean Cultural Continuum. It went through different iterations. That was a conference that I did. I was working for a university at the time. And we set ourselves, and I'm saying this to talk about how the university, the academy, needs to deal with these issues. We set ourselves at the goal of finding the Indian Ocean in Nairobi and spent five days in an intellectual conference and festival that convinced me that I needed to take this up as a serious academic project. Next slide. So on my way, I have done several conferences, several presentations in several spaces. These are four presentations for universities in China, Germany, um, India, and Mauritius, but that's not Mauritius, the US. The point I'm making is if we don't know it, others know how important this is. All of these are presentations on Kanga and there are others. I've also been looking at how to take this conversation out of the ivory tower. And this is an example of artistic events, photo exhibitions, um, kanga workshops, design workshops, and the design workshop, that one is in Germany. So again, this is something we can't afford to let slide because other people realize it is important. Next slide. And so this is what the project now looks like. It's got three parts. And the reason I'm here today is that the first part is very much undergirded by history. It hopefully will be able to interact with all the different disciplines you see on the left, but the three parts of the project, and this is just um, after 15 years, the project has told me what it wants to do. The first one looks at the historical background, so very much going into the long durée of Kanga. The second one is the cultural studies one, the one that everybody wants to do. Sorry, we will not be looking at Kanga names and interpreting Kanga today and the many ways in which people wear Kanga. And the last part looks at the political economy of Kanga. Next slide. And this was a performance I did in, in April. And as you can see, again, I'm emphasizing the many different ways, all these things, conversations, food, lecture, music, academic research, stage, staged um, readings, like the one from Yvonne, people's testimonies, like the one from Diana, all of those are part of the show. At the end of this show, I realized I was trying to do too much in one show, and that's, that's what has separated. Um, so we are reworking the show. I was supposed to take it on the road, but we are reworking the show so that part one exclusively deals with history. And this is for you historians. Um, for me, I've been asking myself, I'm not a trained historian, why is history the thing that is the foundation of this project? I love this quote from Aikwe Ama because Aikwe Ama speaks about the fourth dimension of time. And he says, Africans must start operating in the fourth dimension of time. And the fourth dimension of time is that special area where we take from the past in the present because we want to build the future that we imagine of. 
And so for me, this is something that I carry with me. And this is why the project has shaped itself into the three areas. By the way, each of those three areas has an academic lecture, a, a workshop of some kind um, that people can do stuff with, and then uh, a, a show, a, a, an artistic show. So the 333 is something that keeps recurring in a very interesting way. Next slide. Again, I'm speaking to historians. Let me just clarify me, I stand in that area of memory, but I'm also working with history. So I really love um, Pierre Nora's notion of history and memory always being in conversation with each other. So between Le Lieu de Memoir, between history and memory, I'm moving between those two spaces. I like Tori Morrison is a favorite of mine. And when she talks, her book, Beloved, she comes up with this concept of re-memory. And re-memory, basically um, the definition of it is the minute something happens, a memory, a re-memory a re of it is somewhere hanging about in the universe. We can't see it, but if we look hard enough for it, it is somewhere there. And it's this notion of why she uses stories. Um, she's got an essay, I'll give it to you in the work cited. Um, that talks about uh, truth and fiction, truth and fact are two different things. Historians, I think I would suggest you deal with facts. Those of us from other places say that sometimes to get to the truth of the matter, you can't use facts, you use fiction. So this is why this is just trying to bring everything together. And I've just talked about um, Aikwe Ama and his project is called the project of remembering a continent that has been dismembered. We can go back to those later if you want. Next slide. So now let me spend the most of my time on this palimpsest. Um, can somebody help me? I'm tired of hearing my voice. What's a palimpsest? So just uh, make sure we're all together on this. The word palimpsest. By the way, this is not a trick question. It's just, it, just English, not, not a technical term for it. Well, there's a technical term, but just English, yes. I just ask you to do that because I know some people are online so that they can hear you. Thank you. It, it is a document that has many layers that mm -hmm. may have an original and have had things superimposed and in essentially more than one layer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's exactly that. Next slide. So the palimpsest is it's a document um, when paper used to be very, very expensive. Once you've written something, then people would erase it and they would write under it. They would write a new message and then they would erase and so on. Those of you who remember when you were kids and you wrote to the pencil, if you pressed very hard, even after you erased it, you could kind of read. Or those of you who ever put lemon juice, is this my generation? Only thing only my generation knows. You put lemon juice into an ink pen. I know that people, I can see people who are smiling with me. And then you write and it's invisible ink. And the people who need to know, know what to do to that paper to see it. So that's what a palimpsest is. And I want to suggest to you that a kanga is a palimpsest. Keep that idea of invisible ink. If you know what to do to find it, you will find what is there. But if you don't know, you, you just deal with what you are seeing, right? So I really like this definition. It can also be something that has changed over time, but you can see, kind of see the signs of it underneath that. It shows evidence that there have been changes. So my project is about looking at kanga as a palimpsest and seeing where that takes us. Next slide. So what I'm going to be doing is uh, take you a little bit into Kanga design um, because what Kanga design does, anybody, if you're ever buying a Kanga, there are three things, three broad things to look at. And there is no right or wrong way of buying a Kanga. People pick whatever they think is best. There's the material aspects, the visual aspects and the verbal aspects, back to the threes. This just keeps coming back. So I'm going to talk you through the history because this is a long jury. We could be here the whole day. Actually, my biggest, uh, Dr. Ombongi kept waiting um, for my PowerPoint and it was because it was, it was too long. And I had to think about how am I going to take this long story and make it brief? So I'm going to tell you a history and then come back and use these three so that you can see how the evidence of that history is on the lesson. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's go on and I'll come back to this in detail. Next slide. So I am using a periodization 
by uh, Professor Kusimba, who is an archaeologist. So today we have archaeologists into the room. Uh, and basically, he looks at the long durée of the East African coast. So I'm um, getting away from this notion that our history started, that our history must uh, be determined by the, the colonial era. And for me, the reason I found this very interesting was I asked myself, what would happen if I went as far back as possible and see how far back can I trace, um, can I trace Leso? How far back can Leso take me? Now, um, he has created, you can see period one starts 100 years before the common era. And then it takes us all the way, period four brings us to 1950. So I'm going to very quickly cover that time. So you can imagine there's a lot to talk about. And as I do that, I will be pulling out the elements that take us to the lesso. So let's go to the next slide. And what you see in front of you is this um, map of when we talk about the Ziwaku maritime zone, what exactly are we talking about? So what you need to look at is you can see the red arrows and the Ziwaku. Now, uh, the Ziwaku is animated, if you want, I was looking for the right word, by two sets of winds. The Kusi, which we know comes from what direction? Kusini, right? So the Kusi comes from the south and it blows up and it blows and basically what these people discovered. So there's some so sophisticated science and geography going on over here. But as the Kusi will blow for six months of the year, and then there is a change. And then you have the, anyone know what the other wind is called coming from the opposite direction? The? You're whispering like you, Kiswahili is not our national language. The? Okay, no Kenyans are always very shy about, we know it, Kaskazi, right? Coming from Kaskazini and it comes down the other way. So over time, this is what animated. And actually, um, long durée historians have told us that this region was probably the first region in the world to have intercontinental trade facilitated by the ocean. Rather than seeing the ocean, you know how the Europeans looked at the ocean and then they had maps that said, there be dragons <laughs> beyond that. Um, people from this region saw the ocean as a bridge, not a boundary. And so we can see all the way to the left, it goes as far as um, China and even beyond um, to Japan, but we'll just stick with China for now. And then it comes down. So that is considered the easternmost part, um, northeasternmost part. It includes coming down to the Indonesian islands and the islands around there. And just as a thought, when they go back to do Kikoi, that's where Kikoi's origins come from. It then goes onto the Northern Rim. So crossing to the Indian subcontinent, going up the both the Persian and Arabian Gulf, it goes all the way really to over here, which is how Europe got to know about the riches on this side of the world before they came round, was because it used to go overland before the Red Sea Suez Canal. Um, they cut that to be able to get there. And then we are on the Western Rim of the Indian Ocean. Starting over there, thank you very much, that's great. From Mogadishu is the northernmost um, port of what became known as the Swahili coast. And it goes all the way down to Mozambique, right? So you can see the, the different cities. I know you, you may not be able to see them very well, but it's um, all the way from Mogadishu down to Capo Delgado. And you have um, several, so there is Mogadishu down to Malindi, Mombasa, Zanzibar, Kilwa, Mozambique, Sofala, but also the others like Lamu, Pate, going all the way down to the Comoros Islands, that entire region. So this is what we call the Ziwaku Maritime Zone. There's a wonderful book um, called Abu Bakr's Dream by Otieno Ogai. That's a children's book. I should have come with it for you. Well, children's, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun read. And it's, um, he was working from um, Clelia, Dr. Clelia Kore. She's at IFRA now leading Ifra Nairobi, he took her dissertation and he's turned it into a novel. And in that novel, one of my favorite parts of the book is that Abu Bakr is a sailor and he sails all through this region before the coming of the Europeans. So it was not Europe that brought this trade. Europe was the last ones to come. By the time they came, ah, it was old hat. 
Um, next slide. Now, this is what when people talk about the maritime zone, Indian Ocean, they usually talk about. What people do not also talk about is that these ports, Malindi, Mombasa, Zanzibar, Bagamoyo, Kilwa, you can see them here, are actually just a liminal place of exchange. And the maritime zone actually extends all the way inland as far as the Great Lakes region. Places, that is how, when David Livingstone went to Ujiji, remember that story? That's how they knew how to get him there and bring him back, right? They were established trade routes. What we also do not talk about, because we are usually focusing on this area of Ziwaku, is that the trade routes then go on. This is how the Europeans, you know, they would come, come to, this is the route that they finally used. But they also end up going all the way, and our trade extends all the way to North America. And again, this is, all this has got resonance for what we are calling our, our lesson today. Next slide. So that's the region I'm talking about, I'm drawing from as I talk through the, the, the different parts that we are looking at. Period one, remember this is to the period um, from BCE 100 to the period 300, so to, uh, you know, basically the fourth century. Right, so this is, the, this is, I always get confused, is it a century? We're in the 21st century, so yeah, the fourth century. We can't find very much, obviously, this is where historians have handed the baton over to the archeologists. But in that region, around especially the Swahili coast, what archeologists have found is pottery, because pottery can last long after all these others decomposed. And what is interesting about this period, um, and you know, the archeologists talk about it, is it is, it reminds us that we are an ancient people with ancient civilizations. We did not wait for others to bring. So this may sound like a da obvious thing, but actually there were a lot of scholars before that who said the coast was a tabula rasa and everything you find there came from outside. Other people brought the civilization. So what this establishes for us is that they were indigenous, African civilizations that existed even you know, as far back as we are able as scholars to engage. What is interesting for our research is that the, the pottery has not just, you know how people make things because they just make things because they need them. But when they go to another level, they start to decorate those things. And those um, pottery and wares that have been found have been found with shapes and motifs that we can trace back to less. We can find the same shape, shapes and motifs being used in our lessons today. Again, there have been scholars who have suggested that all the artistic design that we have in the, on this um, fabric has been brought to us from outside. And yes, some of them were because this was an area of exchange, but we know that some of it was indigenous. Crossing over to period two, this is between 300 and 1000. Um, CE, so now we're coming up to the 10th century. What we are finding in this area is that there is conclusive evidence of human settlement um, developing gradually into urban some cities. Again, the genesis of Swahili states. Let me pick Mombasa, for example. Mombasa traces back to the 9th century. Interestingly, Mombasa traces back to a woman, Mwanam Kisi, founded what we call Mombasa, what they, in, in Swahili is Mvita, around the area called Kongwea. This is important because I'm sure all of you learned like I did when we were in high school, that the Swahili did not exist before the Arabs came to the coast, intermarried with Africans, and then we got the Swahili. So archaeologists are, are questioning that, they're challenging that, and they're saying that even the evidence of the cities we have, these cities were founded by indigenous Africans, and we can talk a lot later more about that. The other thing that we find is that there is evidence that cotton was being cultivated in the, on the Swahili coast, at least from the eighth century. And there's evidence of that as from Mogadishu all the way down to Kilwa. There's also evidence of an early maritime culture um, because they found evidence of things that were found that did not come from this continent. Not only have they found evidence here, but on the other side of the ocean, they have found evidence over in the northern rim of the Indian Ocean. So we already know that by the 10th century, people are beginning. Now, 
what we think, what, what is thought is that people are not starting off in, in Kilwa, for example, and then just sailing across the ocean. It probably meant that they moved from one to the next, and then you traded with the next, and then those next moved to the next, and so on and so forth, until they went all the way back. One of my favorite stories that, um, to perform, which is part of, has now gone into the artistic performance, comes from the Kilwa Chronicles. The Kilwa Chronicles is the origin myth of Kilwa. It was transcribed into writing in the 16th century by the Portuguese. And the basic story says that, um, and there are different versions of it, both if you look at the, or the, the oral traditions and the written tradition, but basically there is a ship that is coming from what they call Shiraz. So you hear people talking of themselves as Shirazi, um, the Persian, Persian Gulf. Some people say it was a king who was going to perform um, Hajj in Mecca. They got somehow blown off route. And out of the ships, he had seven sons. Out of one of the ships ends up being blown all the way down. And then it is wrecked. And because Africans are notoriously hospitable, they rescue him. They rescue his people. They give them respite. He falls in love. This young man, Ali, falls in love with um, the local, the person who is living on the island, he's called Murima, falls in love with his, her, the daughter, they get married. So this is a beautiful story, it's a love story. And because we know that these people are matrilineal, at some point, um, either a request is made by Ali and his people, or they say Murima himself says, you know, um, you know these, are, these are communities where they hand over property through the female line. And so they are given the island of Kilwa. And that is the reason that the people of the Kilwa, especially the elite, trace their lineage to the Shiraz. They say our patrilineal line goes to Persia and our matrilineal line goes to the continent. And people have said, okay, there we go again. The woman is subordinate. But actually remember that in these societies, the, the women held the property. It was a very strong tradition. So people have always said, yeah, yeah. And by the way, this story is also repeated. You'll find it in Witu, you'll find it in other places. It's, it's a common story in the city states when they talk about their origins. However, in 2023, Professor Kusimba, remember Professor Kusimba we talked about earlier, was part of a team. They've just released their research. And what they did was they went into um, around Mombasa, Malindi, that area. They've done DNA, they've excavated Ouch. Um, graves of our ancestor, ancestor, ancestors, ancestors. And they've done DNA on some of those graves. And guess what? They find that the patrilineal line goes back up to Persian Gulf. The matrilineal line is from here. So that's very new research. We find an oral narrative that people have dismissed as being just things that people say, being validated by DNA research in our time. So the third thing that we find is during this time, we start to develop long distance textile um, trade and a long distance trade. My favorite story is how the Sultan, so you guys all know about the railway, right? We all talk about the railway, how the Chinese, what's the name of that guy who came, the big captain, when you go to Siokimau, you see um, stuff about him. Okay, I'm reading down history from the, from the ivory tower and you want me to speak like a historian. When you go to the railway line, right? There's a picture of a Chinese uh, captain who sailed the seas in the eighth, I think it's the eighth century. And we found evidence. This is the same captain where a boat was sunk that they have found the, uh, that the descendants are now in Lamu. So I'm making those connections for you. And the reason that China is helping us build that railway is that they're connecting back to these ancient stories. My favorite story is how the Sultan of Malindi decides that because we've gotten all these gifts from the kings and the whoever it is in China, we need to return a gift back. And what do they choose to send? They choose to send a giraffe. I want you to think about that for a moment. A giraffe on a boat from Malindi in Kenya, what we call Kenya today, all the way to China. They somehow kept that animal alive. You know, animals get stressed on a sea with storms and everything. They knew how to feed it. They knew how to look after it because we have it recorded by historians that that giraffe got to China 
And people came from all over to come and see the giraffe. So that is evidence that you have, we had that kind of trade. Next slide. Um, there should be a slide before that. Yes. So now I come to the third century, the third period. Here it is between the 10th century and the 16th century. What's happening really here is that the East African Swahili coast gets so rich because it, remember this coast, the Swahili coast is just the center of exchange. People are coming from all over the Ziwaku maritime zone. They're bringing in so much that they can afford to pick and choose. So whereas before we were producing, cotton was being produced, but it wasn't being produced in large quantities. Now they're getting a lot of textiles coming in. And what happens when people are bringing new stuff? You know, it's like when people are cooking, you know, people are in the farm and it's cheaper for you for, to buy food from them than for you to actually do the farming. So during this period, we see this whole region beginning to use cotton cloth extensively. I'm not just talking about the Swahili coast, I'm talking about going into the hinterland. And this long distance textile trade, I'm focusing on cotton, but really we also start to see silk, we start to see um, on the Swahili coast, it's white cotton, people are not dyeing it, um, most of it, but now they start to import, especially from India. And so you start to see a lot of, and this, this is one of them, um, you, you'll hear the term kaniki, you can go to the shops and talk about kaniki, you'll be able to buy it. A lot of this kind of um, indigo becomes a new color that everybody is like, I don't wear white, I wear indigo, or I wear purple. And you start to see that um, starting to happen. This period is also um, sees a growing demand from cloth, particularly from Kutch and Gujarat. Now I went to Pakistan, this is the same area, and I was given that as a gift, that cloth at the end, it's called Arak, and you can see the similarities with what I'm wearing, right? That comes from Pakistan, it's one of their traditional cloths. I'm not saying we copied, I'm saying that there was an exchange. Um, and the elite in particular starts to say, just like our elite today, why would I wear local when I can wear imported, right? So they're doing a lot of that. Another amazing um, story, the Portuguese report that when they came to Kilwa, there were entire factories where there were people, they would bring in this imported cloth that was dyed in colors. They had the technology to dismantle the cloth so that they would remain with the thread. And then they would mix the thread with their own cotton, which was white, to create interesting designs. So it's a, it's a actually really sophisticated textile tradition that we are talking about. Next slide. No, sorry, don't go to the next slide. It's I moved to period four. Period four is when things really start to happen. So people have been living in harmony in the maritime zone. They visit each other. They trade with each other. They have, you know, quote unquote, wives in every port. I'm not saying that it was always um, peace and everything was good, but the idea that you would go to somebody else's place and try to take it over was really something that this zone did not know. Then comes the Portuguese. We all know the story. In 1492, somebody went around the Cape of Good Hope and then they came up and then they come and as they come, I'm going to cut out the story of Mombasa, Zanzibar, um, Mozambique. They land in Malindi and the Sultan of Malindi says, hey, I'm so happy you are here. I have neighbors up there called these people of Mvita. Niwatuwa Vita. They disturb me a lot. So let us ally with you so we can destroy Mombasa. That's a short version of the story of what happened. The Portuguese come. They're looking for the route to India. Incidentally, the Europeans were not able to find their way to India till when they got to Malindi, there was a, a, a pilot of a ship. His ship had come. He got sick, the story tells us. He was left behind because that's what they did in those days when his ship, because you know, once the wind starts blowing, you can't wait for someone, you need to go. Otherwise, you won't get home. So he was left behind. Portugal comes and they say, don't worry, our ships don't need wind. If you'll take us, we will. You know, we, we, we can take you home. And he says, yes. And he does not realize he has unleashed a catastrophe on his people. Because, and I don't have time to go into the stories of what happens when the Portuguese get to Goa. They burn down cities on the way. They burn down towns. 
it becomes a complete new change. And that's why period four starts with the coming of the Europeans. For us, what is interesting is that the, the, so the, the, when the Europeans came, they were not really interested in the African hinterland. They were only interested of how do we get to India? However, they were fascinated by the, the thriving trade and the thriving cities they found at the coast. They were not the first ones. Even Batuta, who came, historians, 13th, 14th century, said that Kilwa was the most beautiful city he had ever seen. And the Portuguese just talk about this place is so wealthy. Yeah, the gold from Great Zimbabwe, we've never seen anything like that. But they did not try to go inland. They just tried to do the trade, and then they moved on. And what starts is, I don't have the time to go, but there's a, a start of a fight for control. Portugal is trying to take over control of the port so that they can, can control the trade. When Europe finally gets to India, like the British go and take over um, India and that whole area, and they are now interested in the route because they want to protect the trade and so on and so forth. Somewhere along the way, and this I'm telling you because this is a friend of mine who talks about this has been passed down their family memory, so I thank Abu Bakr Zaid. Um, but the history of the uh, Mwaswahili of Mombasa is that they have been colonized by Portugal long before the rest of us knew what colonialism was. So they are fighting against Portuguese colonization. That's in the history books. And what they do is they send a delegation to Muslim, to Muslim empires elsewhere, Muslim kingdoms saying, please come and help us. These, king, these Christians are finishing us. And after a bit of back and forth, at one point, the Turkish come down, Ottoman Empire, then they go back, then the Portuguese come back. If you look at the history of the sieges of Mombasa, that's a history that's well documented, so I won't go into it in detail. They end up being set, told, go to Oman, because the Omani have been able to defeat the Portuguese. So the story is they went and they told the Omanis, please come and help us. And the Omanis said, okay, we'll come. The Omani came, they did manage to get rid of the Portuguese, but then they said, oh, wow, this is such a nice place to be. Why would we go back home? And they stayed. <laughs> and so the Sultanate of Oman takes over the Swahili coast, sets up, as we all know, say it, say it. I'm running over this because see, we all know this like the back of our hands. I'm just reminding you of the history you learned in school. Said Said sets up his kingdom. He then decides, sorry, brings up his capital in Zanzibar because not only does he just love, I mean, who doesn't love Zanzibar? When you go there, it's also a very, um, it's a very, very important economic port, um, port, not just for the Indian Ocean, but it's becoming an important trading point for the whole world. Europe has not only began to trade, but Europe has also began to realize that not only now, I'm not talking about cotton, but there is in that region, the African, Eastern Africa, they can get the best wood in the world for building. They can get ivory. They can get um, enslaved human beings, although many of ours went up north, but they realized that this is a place that is thriving. In fact, the Swahili coast was one of the centers of global trade. Everybody wanted what this coast had. And so everybody came bringing what they had in exchange. And I talked about North America becoming linked to us because what the Americans had was cotton. Remember the history of the South and what was happening in the American South with cotton? And so that cotton would go to Boston and Salem. They would bring it all the way because they had the finest grade cotton in the entire world. They would bring it into our markets because as the British discovered, Jeremy Presthall talks about this, that the most sophisticated market for cotton in the entire world was the East African coast. If you go, I got this from Biashara Street, walk into Biashara Street and ask them for Merikani. You all know the term Merikani. It's just unbleached cotton. The reason it is called Merikani is that it was coming from America and we could buy the best cotton in the world. Now the British get really frustrated. At some point, it is so bad that the British are pretending that their cotton, which is coming from Manchester, is Merikani. So the Americans begin to stamp on their cotton, Merikani. And the British, this is how copyright, in, I, I, intellectual property rights become a problem for us, begin to stamp on their cotton that it is Merikani. 
And it was a sign of being elite to walk about with cloth that had the copyright on it. I'll come back to that in a minute. So as this is going on, of course, Britain and Europe are trying to sell their products to us. It's very expensive to bring cloth from Manchester all the way. Remember, they're using ships. So what do they do? They go to India and they set up factories. And now they're using, trying, because they say, okay, we can't beat the Americans in quality. Remember, America has got very cheap labor because they're using enslaved human beings, right? So we can't beat them with quality. What we can beat them with is price. So if we, it's coming from India, it's going to be cheaper. So they set up factories. The Indians are like, hey, hey, you people, where are you coming from? We are the ones who've been trading with these people all this time. So what do the Indians do? They observe what the British factories are. They look at the technology. They buy the technology. They set up their own factories. Ladies and gentlemen, that is how Bombay became a manufacturing power. The fact that Bombay today is leading the world in manufacturing, they owe it to us. And I'm not the one saying it, it's the history books saying it. So the Indians begin to bring down cotton. Now this is what the Indians have, that the, and I say Indian, I also mean Pakistani, this is what the Indian subcontinent has that Europe doesn't have. They've been trading for a long time in this region. They know the patterns that people like. And they have people. They start sending the third son, the fourth son, you know, that kind of thing. You send somebody down to Zanzibar and Mombasa, they find out what people want, and you send information back up. We are told that the market in Eastern Africa was so sophisticated that when they sent the cotton inland, if people thought the quality was inferior, they refused to buy it. It was the only part in Africa where the British really complain when you read the archive that these people are refusing to take our cotton. It was so sophisticated, that the, and the women were so fashionable, that they would not just buy cloth. So they would say, in our village, what is fashionable is a white cloth with red fringes. And the next village, they want blue cloth with yellow fringes. So the trading merchants would travel with tailors. And when the tailor was in one village, he's, being to, he's preparing for what the next village want. This is why when you look at Kikoi, you know those fringes you see at the bottom? Yeah, that was part of just fashionable in those days or lace. But it's, it's a testament to the fact, I could go on and on, this part really fascinates me. But it's a testament to the fact that at this point, East Africa is controlling the market. So much so that in the US and later in Japan, technology, machines and factories were set up specifically because East Africans refused to buy now, I don't know if I can get Kim Gichi not to be too embarrassed to be seen doing this as a man. But if you look at the Americani, right? Kim Gichi just turn. Can you see how, how long it is, right? You can't comfortably wear that, can you? So the women would say, ah, that's a waste of cloth. I want a cloth that starts under my armpit and reaches my knee. Or if I tie it here, it goes to the bottom. And the British would say to them, the Europeans would say to them, look, our factories are set up to print cloth of a certain width, and so they wouldn't buy it. So the places who are like, okay, give the customer what the customer wants, began to produce this size. So I'm going to ask him, Ngichi, if he can, you can fold that, because now we've seen what it looks like. This size of cotton. And you can see how now, okay, he's tall, but it kind of fits. So again, that's a technological in, in invention that speak to us about that history. Thank you. Okay, and finally, one more thing I'll say about that is, actually, let me move on. I'm looking at the time. Let me move on to the next one so we can finish. So these are pictures taken from the turn of the century in Lamu, Mombasa, and Zanzibar. I don't know if you can see this, but if you see this lady in the um, extreme right-hand corner, that's the design I am wearing today. And it's the design that's there. There are variations of it. But it tells us that these designs have been there for a long time. And if you, you, know, you can look at this uh, closely, you will see that many of the motifs I talked about. What's interesting about this is if you look at these women, looking at their features, you can tell that these are African women. Another myth about Kanga um, push, says that the Kanga was brought not by African women, but was brought by outsiders. And then African women began copying them. 
The story that we have is that it was primarily being worn first by African women. And you can see why the length is so specific because they're wearing it as a form of dress. Um, next slide. So the terms, right? That's a basic history. And now I'm just going to finish by quickly bringing everything together. The terms. Um, we say the word, so the word kanga is a term that many people know. Kanga comes from ki, kiunguja. The reason that ac across the world people use kiunguja more than they use kimvita or kiamu or any other of the dialects of Swahili is because remember the Sultan of Zanzibar when he set up in Unguja and said, this is going to be the capital, all the Europeans who came, including the Germans and the British, first set up office there. So they were told this is how Kiswahili is spoken. Kiunguja is standard. And that's why we call it Fasihi. Okay, I'm simplifying it, but that's where, that's why we use Kiunguja, right? And in Kiunguja in Zanzibar, when they started doing the Kanga, so remember I've, I've shown you it was just that sheet of, just, it was just a plain cloth. And then people more and more began to dye the cloth and to put designs. Now, this is one that it's very modern, but there's some amazing person who is trying to recover the old designs. If you look at it like this, it looks very much as, just like a plain green cloth, right? But if we hold it up, thank you, Kimingichi, can you see the patterns, right, in the light? So you see it in the sun. And this is because they were using mostly natural dyes and stencils or doing it by hand. And what we are told, thank you, is that the original lesso was women just starting to put dots and circles. So this kind of thing. Some of it may be picking up on some of those earlier designs, but really they just wanted to take the plain cloth and make it look interesting. Two reasons for this. Enslaved women, when they were brought to the, to, we all know the history of Zanzibar and the plantations, so brought to work in the plantations, what the owners would do is they would just buy lots and lots of cotton, kaniki, usually the poorest quality, and then they would dye it because you can't have them wearing white, it'll just get dirty. And this, so women seen wearing just um, a sheet of cloth, I mean, uh, some cloth that's one color, were known to be enslaved. Now there was a system where women could work for their freedom. And when you paid back your master or for whatever other reason you were emancipated to show that you were no longer enslaved, the women began to mark what they were wearing because any woman who was wearing cloth that had a pattern could not be an enslaved woman. So one way that people trace the history of Kanga is to say that Kanga came from the most vulnerable women of our society who found a way to free themselves and to mark that emancipation. They marked up the cloth and that is why we have what we have. A story says that the men began to say, when you see a group of women, you know how women always call each other. They're always talking, 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 talking. So they said it reminds them of Kanga, the bird. It looks like the bird and Kanga, the bird never stopped talking. One reason I kind of like that is because I have watched, I've sat, okay, laugh at me, but I've actually observed, I've sat and just watched guinea fowl. The thing I like best about guinea fowl is they move around in groups. They don't move around alone. When one guinea fowl sees something interesting and it goes over to investigate and maybe it's here and it's eating by itself, the others have moved on. When that guinea fowl realizes it's by itself, what's the first thing it does? It calls. And you can hear, I actually have recordings of it. You can hear the tone. It's like, where are you? Where are you? Moko hao, moko hao. You know, that kind of thing. And the others, wherever they are, they stop what they're doing and they start calling. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Until it joins them. And for me, that's the power of women's unity, especially enslaved women who could not afford to be by themselves because bad things could happen to them. Next slide. And oh, I love this because that's at the Malin, that's at the Mombasa, Mombasa airport. Um, local, um, and it's a piece of artwork. And I just love the fact that they have that. So that's why I brought, brought that. I've not met the artist. I'm looking out for him, Theo Spirecraft. I hope one day I'll meet him. Next slide. This is the other um, story. We say Leso. Leso is linked to Kim Vita, the language of Mombasa. 
And the story is, going back to the Portuguese I talked about, is that one of the things that the Portuguese brought as they were trying to, to um, sell their wares were these, we all know this, we all know this, we call them bandanas. The original name in Portuguese is leso. And so they brought these and people say that young women who wanted to be fashionable but didn't have enough money, remember I talked about everybody was trying to wear imported. So see, this is imported, but you can't really, even if your house small, you can't wear this. So what the young women began to do is they would sew them up. I'm going to ask the two gentlemen. And you can see when you sew them up, it actually will cover your body. Right? So six of them. But you can see how the basic border design starts to be seen. And you can see that these are common motifs, right? Right. So that's how the name Lenzo comes about. And it reminds us of the Portuguese. So I've said thank you. One motif is the African. One motif is the Portuguese. The last one I will say, I found this in one book, Sharifa Zawawi talks about this. When you buy a lesser, you see how the edging is, right? Sometimes they cut it nowadays because we are modern, we use scissors. But traditionally, they would just tear it. You know how you just tear something along the weft? Those of who are in school with me, I can see you nodding. You remember our teacher, Mrs. Karanja, teaching us about the weft and the Yes, and you can just tear it. And when you tear it, what's the sound it makes? Yeah, that kind of sound, which is why we spell it as hanga, K-H-A-N-G-A. Turn, next. So some people say that's why we have the three names. So kanga, 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 the name itself has history. I'll finish by looking at those. I've actually told you most of it. Um, we were talking about this with Mwali Mugona earlier on. Material is usually cotton. And um, people are trying to do new things. So this one here is polyester. I'm told that it didn't, you know, they tried to produce them. People weren't very interested in them. I know people who are trying to now talking about printing kanga in silk, printing it in different things to see where it can go. But that's the reason that we kangas come in cotton. So when you pick up your kanga and it's cotton, remember the history. The weight, we were talking about this with Malimu earlier on, and you'll notice that some of the ones that I have are very light. Um, oh, it's this one. This one is very light, and this is because it also comes, you know, this, this one is from Zanzibar, Dukala Chavja. And if you're aware it's hot, sometimes people want light ones, but people might also want heavy ones. And those of you who are here, later on, feel free, you can come and look at it. It will actually say Pamban Zito. Right? So Malimu were talking about this. For certain tasks, if you're working in the farm, you want something that's heavier, more durable. You also will see, uh, I know I've been bullying Kimingichi, but I also bully Malimu Gona. I want you to, to hold that. And then I want you to hold this one in front. Can you see us on the camera? What do you notice? It's transparent, but what else? One is smaller, right? Because we know African women's bodies come in different sizes. So if I was to put this one, I would have done this if I wasn't holding the mic. It barely goes around me. But if I put on this one, it completely goes around me. You see, as people, we look after each other. We don't like embarrassing each other. So <laughs> shapes. Again, I'm going back to the three. Cotton as a fabric. The weight, back to that question of quality and the different kinds of quality that were coming to us. Some are more um, rough. Others, the, the longer you have them, this one, I've had it for ages. It's very soft. By the way, okay, I won't go into the next one, but they're used for, they used to be used for napkins when they get old and they're soft and things like that. And then the size. The size reminds us that it's supposed to fit a woman's body. And we look after small girls and we look after big women as well. Next size. Next one is, yeah is the visual. And when we talk about the visual, so um, the new place, yeah, the one where you are, the blue one. The new rabbit hole I have fallen into, like Alice, is the amazing world of African fractals. I'm in the world of mathematics. We know what a fractal is. It's where you see a shape repeated, 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 repeated. So kanga is about rectangles, as you notice. Some people, I will argue personally, because fractals also take us to the world of um, 
architecture. Um, there's an amazing scholar who's been doing this work. He flies over African cities, not all of them, the traditional ones. The, and, and he talks about how you can see geometry. The, the, it, it's not just like you go to, I'm thinking of which ancient one, even here, um, Great Zimbabwe, you fly over Great Zimbabwe and there's actually a geometry seen from above. And if you look at some of the, remember the Swahili houses are rectangle. There's this thing of rectangles. I haven't put it in because that was just going to be another rabbit hole. I could go in for forever. Fractals also talk about this shape being repeated. So you have the outer one and then an inner one, an inner one. You see how it's, it keeps being repeated. And this sense of in geometry, things can be repeated again and again and again and again to infinity, which reminds us that Africa is truly the mother of geometry. Um, now, very quickly, again, this reminds us that it comes from an urban setting. The middle of the lesson, no matter what the pattern is, is called mji, which means town. And around a mji, to keep it safe, remember this design is emerging after the Swahili states, particularly Mombasa and Zanzibar, have gone through um, oppression, domination, colonization. To keep a city safe, you need a, a wall or a border. Some people say it can also represent the shamba that every, every city has lands on the sides where people farm for food. And then you have Kilindo who are the guards because you need people watching out to keep you safe. And then this is where you have your text boxes. Before computers introduced us to text boxes, kangas did. We have our text box, which is the name of the kanga. And then we have the copyright. So copyright did not start with Kikobo in our part of the world. Next slide. And you will see this um, again and again and again, it is replicated. I have a lesson here. This one is currently being produced by Rivertex and it gives you that basic design. I love it because it's empty in the middle and you can see it. And I'm told what they hope is that those of you who are too lazy to design can now take it to River Road and put in your own design in the middle. But every lesson, no matter what it looks like, has the same design. Next slide. I'm coming to the end, but I just wanted to give you now. The other thing and the visual, I'm not going to go into the motifs. That's going to be the next whole presentation because we will read Kanga design very specifically, but the design workshop teaches people the basics. Remember I talked about things like indigo, I said purple had a color, I showed you here how they're using natural colors. So down here, these are very much the old colors. If you look at this lesso, you can see it's the same design here. So people also do a lot of repetition of popular designs. And these are examples of some of the new lessos. We're using a lot of <laughs> interesting colors. Anything the computer can give us, we are now doing it. I know some people who loathe the old, these new designs and some people who love them because they're keeping it alive. The other thing that you will look out for is the motifs. And some of these motifs literally go back to that long jure period. I talked about the dots. I had a grandmother who would um, said that every authentic kanga must have dots. Um, the other one that's really, really loved is, I'm surprised I have not put a kanga out with it, but you know the one that looks like a, this one, the one that looks like um, a, 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 a mango, yeah? And there's a meaning to that. Many people read it as fertility. It also takes us back to India. Right, remember um, the Indians use it a lot, ambi, and it's also a sign of fertility. This lesson for me is one of my favorites because it combines three design elements. The dots, which many people associate with Africa, the korosho or cashew nut or embe, which some people will say is in conversation with the Indi India or the Indian subcontinent, and the lines which are often by some people associated with the Omani Arabs. So on one lesson, you have the history, that history of who came um, at which point. The other thing I will point out since this one is up is you notice that the language, I'll come back to that. You can see the language is in written in Latin script, right? Latin script, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay, we'll come back to that in a minute. Thank you, Kimingichi. And you know, I'm, I'm doing this all the time when I look at the lessons. It's, it's another one you just go in and you can't stop. But 
the motifs are, and there are whole many things when we come down, we'll break it down to symbolic, natural, abstract, and so on. Move on. And all of those have meanings that go back to our history. Now, this is what many of us ignore. Right at the corner, when you look at the verbal, I'm at the last element, and then I'll finish, is the copyright, right? Haki, maliki, haki biliki, the copyright. It's one of the most fascinating parts of the lesson. You will find the name of the commissioning factory. Remember, so I'll tell you the story of these commissioning factories in a second, but the factories, the kangas are designed, the designers take them to, usually it's a shop. So you've seen Mali Abdallah, Dukala Chavda, Rafiki, they're the ones who design it. And then they send it to a factory and it's made. And a lot of these factories, by the way, are in India. And there's a whole story, which is why I'm doing a whole section on political economy. Um, and many of them are in India, some are in Tanzania, Kenya, we killed ours with River Tex, Kikomi, but we're starting to bring them back. And then they have a design number. Because if you're sitting in Unguja and you're asking somebody to design Kanga in India, they had better get it right. Because every two weeks, you have to bring out a new design. And you can't, you never know which design is going to stick. So you tell them, okay, bring me 200. And then of all the, you know, you have five different designs, one design sells out. Everybody wants that design. So you send a telegram to Bombay and tell them now, design number 678, that one, print another 500. Because you have a limited time to sell those that particular set. So all of them have designs. They also have something that will say Pambaya sometimes. Pambaya Tanzania, Kenyan cotton, um, because it goes back to the origin of the cotton. Remember when I said people would say, I only do Congo for, cotton from the US and not from this place. So again, in this little patch that most people ignore is a lot of history that we need to go back to. I just wanted to show you how the design can be so integrate. And when I talked about the Kilindo, where the guards are, there's some amazing things that happen in some of the Kangas, right? And you can see it's really, sometimes it's really beautifully rendered. And here are some, you can see how that motif keeps appearing, but in different forms. Next slide. And I am going to finish just by, we all know about the names. This is at the heart of the second presentation, so I'm not going to go into that. But Kanga has famously, before we had t-shirts, we had Kanga, where people would use the Jina, the name, to send a message. Um, I love these two. This is a modern one. Hata message, mapenzi iwe tamu kiasi, ila haishindi message ya mpesa. Doesn't matter how sweet talk you give me, guy, give me, send me a mpesa. And that one I love, my friend Electina Wasike took it um, at a funeral and it says, Kijiji Kidogo Wambea Milioni, small village, one million gossipers. And when I, I asked her about it, she says, oh, I know why she wore that one. So the messages are being sent. And I love that this was a village in Western, not one at the coast. Next slide. Now finish, I'm finishing with this one. This um, gentleman, I wanted to finish with him. If you go to Mombasa, for many of us who have been uh, buying kanga for a long time, Mwalimu, we're talking about this, Mwalimu Gona, the, the, the top trademark is Mali Abdallah. The story of Mali Abdallah is that his grandfather, that um, Mze, Mze's grandfather, is Mze Kadedina, Mze's grandfather came um, to East Africa from India. Um, so that's, we're talking about around the time, actually at the turn of the century, worked in Zanzibar in a shop, finally moved to Mombasa, started his shop. It's a long story. I'm not going to tell all of it. But he is the one credited with adding the Gina, adding the name. And the story is that his wife noticed that as women came to the shop to buy Leso, they named the Leso. And sometimes it wasn't obvious after the design. Sometimes it was the name of a song, a Tarab song that had just come out, or it was a line from a poem or something like that. And so he said, you know what? Um, already in, Muslim, in Islamic culture, people sometimes print on the cloth verses from the Quran or something like that. Why don't we just put this? Because we can't print. And to this day, Mze was telling me, Mali Abdallah will not print anything to do with the name of God on a kanga because they don't know why, how you will use that kanga. So they said, but we can print everything else. A lot of other kangas do have the name of God. And if you use that, you're supposed to only use it 
for certain things. You can't, you can't, you know, sit on it. You can't, people will use it maybe for prayer or for something respectful, going to church and things like that. What I like about this one, this is a sample they have. It dates back to 1938 in the archive. This is a Barclays Bank check. So this one was printed in the US, in, sorry, in the UK. And what I like about it is if you look down there, the Jinnah is in Arabic. So the last historical fact I think I'll share with you today comes from the 1930s, when Britain woke up one day and decided by the stroke of a pen to make hundreds of literate people illiterate when they said that in the colony, in their colonies, the only writing that counted was writing that was done in the Roman script or the Latin script, A, B, C, D. Before that, Kanga were printed in Arabic script because that's how Swahili has been written for centuries. And after that, we started using the um, Latin script, which is the one that you are more familiar with. Move on. And really, I'm opening it out for the conversation. I thank you for your patience. I know we've crammed a lot. But what I wanted to share with you is that these common, humble cloths that every one of us has in our house is actually a history document. It's actually a history textbook. And you can use it to go back all the way long durée and bring you all the way into the present. And by the time I get finished with the third part of this project, we will be looking at the political economy of Kanga and going into the future. Thank you very much. Before I officially ask you to clap for Shay, I would want to just say something about, about this presentation. Remember, we're talking about bringing down history. And perhaps Mushai has made me understand the motivation behind that subject, that topic. Think about it. Here, we have professors of history. They're trying to document history in their own ways, writing papers, writing books. Here is a community that has done it for a long time just using simple ways. And that is a one way of having history around. So we have so many historians and Mshai has brought those historians in here without physically bringing them here. She's a performer. In performance, space is very important. And I introduced her by talking about spaces, opening up spaces that we had spaces in terms of narrators in our community. We, had, we have spaces in terms of performing within digital space now, and we have physical spaces where we perform. Look, this is a space in itself and a performance going on. I didn't know that you could look at this and it carries history from many regions and history and also art from many regions. That, in a way, also reminds you that we can bring down history through different modes, emphasizing modes. So one day you don't have to teach anything. You just arrange lessons around the room, and they just walk and look at it. I was taking notes because I wanted to make references. But Mshai being a performer, I forgot and started just listening to her and enjoying that. So performance, performing history, more and more, like I said the last time, it seems you'll be hiring some of us. You just say, it's my, your class, but you hire a performer to come and perform history. Please clap for our historian and the performer. <laughs> And perhaps that is one of the things we'll have to be reflecting about. Uh, issues to do with modes in terms of how we have brought down history in terms of sources. What are our sources of history? And uh, the poem at the beginning was questioning that, how some of us ask for evidence. And I'm sure I mentioned some of, well, one aspect about us those of us who come from literary circles, 
and the historians. We have what we call artist, artistic truth or truth in fiction, which is slightly different from facts that you people emphasize. Because we think what matters to human beings are not facts. Sometimes I don't know how you quantify emotions. When you say someone was so sad, what is the fact of measuring the level of sadness? Uh, I think we were joking about that this morning, how when we are making any presentation and we have people from education, they keep saying that is not measurable. So remove it. And for, for us measuring these things that we deal with is hard. I don't know whether you want someone to cry so much so that we know that it's painful or put on a different face. So those modes and sources are very, very important. That we also talk about modes of transmission and let's expand history in terms of just exploring what are these spaces that we look for in terms to find history. And oral history being such an important aspect of our African history and a way of defining us. Uh, Dr. Mshai mentioned uh, uh, several people who are talking about memory, remembering, and that is a, an, a, an important aspect for us, reconnecting with our ancestors, whether the memory is through Leso or the memory is through people who can be able to narrate what has just been said. I think I want to open up the discussion, and Mwalim Gona here is burning with the <laughs> given that he planning and I think that was one way of celebrating the coastal history. Let's give him the first chance. Okay, let me start. Um, thanks, Jay. Um, you, you actually ended me when you say that you're going to speak about the message. Maybe in Kiswahili, uh, there are terms like uh, ushari, uh, uchokozi, ukware. Uh, uh, you know, as you come to speak to us about uh, the messaging, I would want you to speak about these uh, three concepts ushari, uchokozi. Ukware, in terms of messaging, I mean that's it's looking forward. Uh, two two questions. I mean, I like the way you you talk about kanga as, as performative, um, and in the areas of you know as 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 conversations. But two um, two two things. So how how do you uh, consider appropriations of of the kanga? In, in terms of ownership, all right? In terms of ownership, who, who, who can we say owns the kanga? And that there are people who have appropriated the kanga in such a way that uh, we can actually dismiss them that no, that is not what uh, we mean. Uh, in terms of just something to reflect on, it's about uh, the kanga, the bird as colorful, right? Um, I think you didn't bring that uh, uh, out strongly. I think you need to consider that uh, uh, the beauty of the kanga has to be maintained. And, and for those who come from the coast, if you don't do a good kanga in terms of the beauty, then we dismiss it because you are actually abusing the kanga. Thank you. As Mwalimu is about to pick up, and I'll have just to pick these two before another, because the weight of the questions might take some time. I don't want the respondent. But I'm thinking about, you said Uchukozi. Uh, I was talking to my student about uh, a, using oral literature as a form of ventilation. We have circumcision ceremonies and people come and say all the nasty things so that they ventilate. Do people just go with these messages? Ah, watu wameni kera sana. Wacha niende niandike message kubwa kwa 
Koleso. Uh, I, I'm think I would like to find out whether I can also do that and walk around saying Michukizo na University of Nairobi ni one kaka kaka. As a malimo, malimo. Let, let, let me also uh, stand. Uh, Michelle, thank you very much for honoring uh, uh, this appointment. We have been communicating back and forth uh, for, for quite a while now. Now, I, I feel a little more educated now than I have ever been. Uh, uh, for those of us who did Swahili, there was a saying which went, Usimulawumu dobi kaniki nirangi yake. I now know uh, what that means, uh, you, you know. Um, Kim talking about uh, simple ways. A, a colleague from Kenyatta University, when he saw our e-flyer, he called me and said, uh, now you guys, you are going overboard. Uh, I know you are bringing down uh, history and archaeology, but now you are going overboard because Kanga, uh, or less, it's something women tie around the West in my village. So you mean you have gone that down? Uh, <laughs> so, so I'm sure uh, the colleague uh, uh, must be online. He is he, clear with what we intended to do, particularly from the explanation that um, uh, uh, Kim uh, gave. Now, uh, let, let me just uh, raise a few questions, uh, 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 Mushai. Uh, if I had you correctly, I, I came in five minutes late, but I was listening to you online because uh, I was coming from another meeting. Uh, yours is um, Kanga as uh, intersections of cultures, in intersections of imperialisms, which are not one, imperialisms, you know, Portuguese, Al Arabs, and, and then the British. Uh, then uh, you, you touched on, uh, you know, in some kind of intersections of gender. But I was struggling to, to find men in the, in the Kanga mapping. Uh, uh, where are the men in the Kanga mapping? Are they just uh, traders and printing? And uh, in the Kanga conversations, where are the men? Uh, please help us. If, if, if they are not there, uh, then we know that uh, they are not there. And then uh, another one is, um, you, you talk about historians dealing with um, uh, facts only. Um, you seem to be a very good student of uh, Harriet Carl in his book, What is History? Uh, but uh, in history, we deal with more than just facts. There are facts, and more importantly, there are also ideas uh, for us, the interpretations that we make, uh, we, which are determined by the paradigms that we use, the perspectives that we 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 want to uh, to, to to take. Um, now, in line with that, um, you seem to be taking the long durée approach, which is wonderful. But then, silently, I also hear uh, you going uh, what the British call the Whigs' interpretation of history, actually. Uh, the utilitarian approach uh, to, to historical discourse. Uh, you know, when you talk about the past of the present uh, for the sake of uh, the, the future, uh, that's overly utilitarian. And I thought probably you, you might want to uh, speak to that, especially as uh, your methodological category. Uh, you confining yourself to the long durée, wonderful. Uh, 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 mainly used by the French, or you want to also comment about uh, the implied uh, utilitarian thinking that you seem to exhibit in uh, in, in 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 your presentation. I, I could have asked more, but let me give a chance to the others. Thank you. Like I said, the, uh, the questions are rather many. I'm to, I'll take you in the second round. Let um, shall I react to that so that we. First, they locate the men within the conversation, then you can ask someone. Thank you. Actually, while I'm speaking, because I'm sure you're tired of my face, 
if you just put on that last slide, because it's going to give some sources, I'm just going to share what I've done with the, I've definitely not given you an extensive bibliography, but because every time I do a version, whether it's um, the performance or a workshop, people want to know, can I read more? Where can I find this out? So all these sources are either books you can buy in Kenya, or you can find this material online. So I was trying to make it as accessible as possible to everyone. So I'll ask him to leave that up as I speak. If you want to do a screenshot or whatever, photograph for those of you in the room, please feel welcome to do that. Let me quickly go. So Mwali Mugwana, I am really holding myself back on this thing of, and I'll tell you why. Like I said, I've got three different parts to the project. And the second one, the, the mistake I made when I did the performance, I see a couple of people who are there, was I tried to put that into this first one and it just got unmanageable. Because I think when we come to how women use the lesson, not just women, how it's been used, it deserves someone to sit and give it time. Um, I think of most of the scholars who have studied Leso or Kanga, majority of them have spoken to this aspect, you know, if uh, the cloth that speaks, all the way from Professor Yaya Othman, whose work I use, um, Professor Raya Timami, whose work is amazing. I mean, a lot of the scholars have focused on this and I felt it would not do their work justice to fit it into five minutes. But you're right. I mean, Kanga is amazing. What you just said, you know, this thing of uh, my, my brother Kimingichi, um, because we, many of us, African culture, certainly Swahili culture, the idea of respect and the idea of co how, you, how you speak, even when you're telling somebody off or you're expressing your anger, or you, 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 you have to be careful because you have to maintain the relationship. So perhaps um, just that example of one of the ways that people communicate, I do not like what you have done. I have something to tell you is to wear a kanga. So I deliberately put that woman up who says, Kijiji, Kidogo, small village, one bear milioni. Somebody's gossiping about her and she wants them to know that she knows, right? You can wear it and that way you can fight with your mother-in-law, which is unknown, right? Um, a very close friend of mine was telling me how the kanga that has the story in her family she wants more than anything else to find out more about, but she can't ask, is that her father gave his, her mom a kanga that says, Unisamehe. There's a lot in that. <laughs> right? Which takes us to the question of how men can use kangas. Listen, folks, you don't have to, you don't have to have everything women have. Yes, you can wear them. But kangas are a beautiful thing for you. It gives you power. If you have not bought your mother a kanga, please buy one. Everybody listening to me. If it's not your mom, your grandmother, your sister, your significant other, your neighbor, whoever you want to please. It's cheaper than buying them a box of chocolates or a bunch of flowers for Valentine's and they'll keep it for longer. That's my personal plug. But this takes me back when I was, um, when I launched this in 2008, you just reminded me of this story. I did this at the Zanzibar meeting and there was somebody who was not from this region who listening to my very beginning presentation said, oh, I'm going to buy Kanga immediately after this. Is there any that, that are for men and those ones are for women? And I'll never forget, there was a Swahili scholar sitting in the front and he just said, etinini, alise manini, in Swahili. What did he say? And so I repeated the question because I thought he was an old man. I thought he hadn't heard it. He started to laugh. He laughed until the tears ran down his cheeks. He could, and every time he would start, he would laugh again. And he said, why would you as a man want to wear a kanga? Now, men do wear kangas even in Swahili culture. You wear your wife's kanga, you wear it in the home. The day I see my husband in another woman's kanga is the day I pack and go home and he comes to explain to my family why he's wearing another woman's kanga. Of course, today people are starting to do fashion design. We're using kanga in many different ways. And I think one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is how do we keep this tradition going for another century? So is there room to allow men who are jealous of women as they always are, because you know, God created men, then he created the best, he created women, but hey, that's how God, and God is both male and female operates in my world. But really it is to ask, 
are there ways, if we want kanga to be meaningful, should we say men shouldn't wear it? Or should we say, yes, you can wear it in circumstances A, B, C, D? And that will take us, I don't want to see I'm already there. I don't want to go into that second one because um, I look through, in that one, I'm so far, I'm at seven different ways that kangas operate, including as an archive, as a journal, um, to send messages. I say the original SMS text was on a kanga, that kind of thing, right? Short message system. So yeah, so that's a whole area. And I hope I'll be invited again, maybe if not by the Department of History, by the Department of Literature, and we can talk about the cultural side. Um, questions. Um, thank you very, very, let me, Walimu, did I finish your question? Appropriation. That's a very, very interesting one. And it's one that um, Diana, whom I hope is online, and if we go online, we'll have a chance to say something Diana brings up. Diana is, as she says in the poem, she's higher. But this whole, now what does, one of my other common treasures I will say I want to look at, God giving me life, is Swahili. And just Swahili, both the people, both the language, both the culture, you know, Swahili is has got so many different meanings. And we need to both pay attention to the specificity of when we say Swahili. There is such a thing as the Swahili people with a history. And no, they are not, quote unquote, a bastard culture. The Swahili existed before anybody else came. But then they have evolved over time. And what does that mean? And then what does it mean that we all own Swahili as our language and we have all appropriated, quote unquote, Kanga culture? One of the areas my research has also taken me, I was going through the Maasai market and this woman walked past me and she had a less, so I didn't bring it today because that's a whole other story, with the saying in Ma, because I kept reading it and I was thinking, hey, that Swahili is, how come I don't understand it? And then I realized it was actually not in Swahili. And I'm now interested in finding out at what point, if I tell the people in the room, go and buy me a Maasai Kanga. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the red and white. We all know the red and white. Most of us know. I see some men saying, wow, there's such a thing as a Maasai Kanga. The Maasai have taken the lesso and made it their own in a very specific way. Is that appropriation? What I'm wearing, when people look at it today, see, we say that's Giriyama, Mijikenda. The Mijikenda, particularly the Giriyama, have attached meaning to this so that it is not just another lesso. And we were talking about this. In Zanzibar, they call it, in fact, I was told this name, Kisutucha Shetani or Kisutucha Pepo, and their meanings associated. Pepo not in the bad way, but in terms of the spirit. In Mombasa, it, what was more common was the indigo blue one, which I should have brought and I forgot to bring, which is more of this color. My question then is, what does, it, it takes us to this place. Again, in political economy, I'll talk about this. What does appropriation mean? What does it mean to have intellectual property rights as a community? What, who do we need to pay for this, right? What does it mean that we are wearing cloth and we are saying, um, we have that uh, ambi, the one I was saying, the ambi, the embe, the korosho, that symbol, that motif, and it means something to us. The brown one I had, the very light one, um, has been read by somebody who said to me, but that's the Omani sword. It also is, speaks to the Omani swords. And you can see, when you see um, Swahili weddings, sometimes the groom will have the sword with him, which speaks to the Omani culture, but it's also on that list. So, so where does appropriation start and end? And it's a question, I hope, this is why I say for me, I want to raise questions, not to answer them, that we always end with conversation. Ah, uh, Ziwaku, Kanga, the birds. What was it about the bird? I always love that bird. It was a comment here. Okay, Mwalimu Ombongi, the idea of, yes. So I, I deliberately wanted to put my methodology out there and to say history can be used in many different ways. For this project, I'm being very deliberate. I want history to mean something to the ordinary person. If you are Kenyan, you remember a certain time when our Minister of Education, the then Minister of Education, made a statement by asking, why, sh why should we teach our children that Vasco da Gama came to, the, to, the, to, to Malindi? What meaning does it have? Why should we bother teaching history when we can be teaching science and technology? And I am saying we need to teach history 
it is not, history is not a fringe subject. And by the way, I'm not a historian. I'm not a professional historian. I did not study history after form two, form one. From one, Mrs. Mwangi, then from two, our teacher went on maternity leave. I did not study history again until graduate school. I sat in a history graduate class one semester and I said, these people are possessed. The reading they were doing, I was like, hey, see you. I've not gone back to class, but I've gone back to history. And for me, I, I want to use history in this project to make the argument that we cannot dream the Africa of the 25th century, if we do not start now by engaging our history. So that's why I am, and that's why I made a point of putting that conceptual. History can be used in many different ways. And by the way, let me, let me say this. And I know um, I can come across as saying, I don't like what the historians are. You know, you, you historians in the academy, why aren't you coming down? I'm not sure that's your job. I said, if you're in the academy, you are paid to think, you are paid to research, you are paid to teach. There's a reason you have a discipline. But once you produce that work, it must be accessible to the rest of us to be able to use. And that's what I am saying. So I, I start by paying tribute to professional historians, professional archeologists, because if they don't do the work, then I can't do my work. And that's what a lot of us performance scholars, we are called promiscuous. Because us guys, we go where we need to go, find what we need to do, and yeah, we move on. But we need the discipline that comes with the disciplines. And then we use those disciplines. We use the theory. So yes, I might say, they'll say things like, you know, back to Diana, subaltern, whatever. But I'm talking about the subalterns. Does the subaltern speak, Spivak asks us. Kanga tells us, yes, they do. Look at our sayings, right? So it's making that theory make sense in the everyday everyday world. Um, I'll take a couple more questions, which was appropriation interaction, the place of men, I've dealt with that. By the way, um, I, I'm not joking, by the way, the, one of the fascinating things for me is that this is a gendered study and, and I didn't intend it to be. And the more I went, the more I found women all over the place. And I was like, but we're always told that African women were submissive and in their houses and doing nothing until Western feminism came to liberate them. And then you're told, no, Mombasa was started by a woman. No, it's the women who started this thing of the designs. And they're all over the place. For me, what is interesting is it speaks to, I'm not sure if I want to, I can call it feminism, but it speaks to a form of gender relations where people are not shy about complimenting each other. In Swahili culture, it's the men who go shopping for kangas. It's the men who select the kangas. I actually they do the shopping for everything, even the household goods. And there's no shame in doing that. It speaks to us of another world that we can go back and ask, what does gender look like in the Ziwaku Maritime Zone? Right? So for me, again, I'm opening questions, but we'll welcome you to wear kangas. My husband, and he had better say yes if he's online or wherever, only wears my kanga and nobody else's. Um, because if he doesn't, he's in trouble. And then speaking of facts and evidence, let me also pay tribute. Again, like I said, I, I used certain historians. My favorite Kenyan historian, I'm going to say it, University of Nairobi historians, you can stone me, is E.S. Atieno Odhiambo because of the way he tells. He's a storyteller. You start reading his history and you don't even realize you're reading a professional history. Yes, he is. I love, I love, I love. I love the rest of you, but E.S. Atieno Odhiambo is my historian. But for me also, I remember in grad school, one of the books we read was Speaking of Vampires, Louise White. And the rest of the class hated it because she went to rumors <laughs> and she was mining rumors about vampires to see what, and then she said, but there's history here. So the professional historians in the class were saying, Sasa, this one. And me, I was like, yes, yes, yes. This is what I want. So I'm drawing from history. I pay tribute to the professional historians who have made it possible for me to do the work that I am doing. Thank you. Okay, uh, back there. I'm, I'm now wondering whether to balance by starting with the lady, then, then we come to you, Big Ben. Uh, okay, this is a, among the most very good presentations. I never thought that Akaga carries history, 
despite the fact that I'm one person who loves a lesson, I have so many lessons in my house, but I never thought that it was a piece of history. Uh, my concern is when I look at the, the lessons on display here, when I look at them, uh, uh, Dr. Ali, you have mentioned that these lessons have, as we are also able to see, have some artistic designs or decorations. And some of these artistic decorations, you have mentioned that they are as a resultant of some of the, uh, the excavated pottery at our Kenyan coast. Now we are seeing that that is an aspect of prehistory that is coming back now in the present history with, with the coming up of these decorations. Probably what does this imply in the, in the current history in the 21st century? Thank you. Now, Ben. Uh, I think I need to stand up so that uh, you notice that I'm around also. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ari, for that good presentation. I, I really like it, but uh, I only have one question. Uh, based on what you said, uh, you know, some of the decorations that we see there, motifs, eh, are abstract. And we know from uh, an artistic uh, perspective, uh, some motifs are so much abstract and only understood by the artist himself or herself. So my question is, from the kangas we see around and even beyond this room, we have seen so many decorations. In fact, uh, my old mom wears some. But when I look at the decorations, motifs, I don't look at the writings, eh? because the writings, uh, for me, they could be actually self-explanatory. So I am wondering, as a historian, or as an anthropological archaeologist, how does that abstract art inform the historical knowledge? If some of these decorations are so much abstract and only known by the artist, how do I pen of it as a, a historian or an archeologist or an anthropologist? Because even if I look at some of those decorations there, I don't understand what they mean, but they mean something to the artist himself or herself but I want knowledge out of it. So I want to say that there is quite a lot in this lessons that is not communicated to the historian. So we have a lot of history that is out there in the lessons we are talking about that we don't know about. Those of us who are professional historians or archeologists, and I want you to agree with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, ben is asking that they agree with him. I remember reading this. And I saw it mingi hapa. Kazima mungu anaweza yote. <laughs> we had a question there. Which I will have to trouble himself with that. I had already convinced myself on that. Uh, okay, Masika. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Uh, Dr. Ari, that, that, that was perfect. But uh, just to follow up on what my chair, Dr. Ombongi said uh, the question he posed, the main concept or the main presence. I I've been reading a lot on the lessons and they seem to be feminine. Even the messages they pass across. Mume wa mtu simtaki, akintaka simuachi. Kuja mambo mengi tu sana na wataja they, they are on women, 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 women. Why? J, Ebony Ulize Katika Kiswahili. J, Lamanisha Kwamba Mambo Mengi and Ayo Zunguka Leso, Yanafanya Nawana Dada. Men can buy Leso as a present, yes. But which message? If I go to buy one uh, to take to. Which message should I look for? <laughs> because mara nyingi zina maana fiche sana. Waweza fikiria umenunua leso ambalo linabeba maana nzuri lakini kumbe la mtusi mamako. 
mtusima mako so why is it that almost 99% of the messages are zeroed around uh, female uh, female or women thank you very much okay and i, I wish i would have asked masika to tell me whether there is another space where messages target men too because then and yes, there are messages that target men. So this is the whole point. A woman can never have too many lessons because you keep buying them so that you have the perfect lesson for every occasion. So you just buy. Sometimes you buy and you keep. And when you need it, it's there. So if you walk in as a man and your wife is wearing a lesson that says uh, Nisamehe, and you know she has not done anything, who do you think she's sending a message to? <laughs> And there are many ways. So women use lessons. And let me start with that last question. It is a gendered text, right? And texts are gendered. There are many, many different types of texts. I just happen to be sending, to be working with a gendered text. And I'm glad that Diana, in the poem, that, and which is really a witness, a statement that I started with, says she wanted to study lesso because she also wanted to study her femininity and masculinities. Because the question then comes, if there is space for men, not necessarily to wear lessons, although as I said, they do wear them, but their children wear, boys will wear lessons. There's a point after which you cannot wear a lesson in some cultures. Um, now you guys go to Samburu, go north, going back to how lesson has traveled, the men wear lessons. So it's again, culturally specific. But my question is, apart from wearing, how else might men use lesso? And in cultures where sometimes it is not appropriate for men, either of certain ages or in certain circumstances to talk to women directly, you talk using a lesso. So you want to pledge your love, my friend, buy a lesso. If you see her then wearing it, out in, you know those lessons that say, nampenda mseme mnaviosema. She's telling you a message, me, I'm okay. You guys, let's move on. Come and see my parents. Let's talk. If she doesn't wear it, then you know, eh, okay, hapo. And she'll keep it. Don't worry, one day she'll wear it. She may not just wear it to you. So there's also a space where men ask themselves, apart from being traders, apart from being the ones who buy, apart from being the recipients of messages, apart from looking at what messages are women wearing and what are they telling us? And how do we use that knowledge so that we can look like we know what we are saying, even though it's, we're being told by women? There are many ways. For me, I want men to explore that because there are other texts. I said I started out with Kanga and Kikoi. Kanga just became overwhelming. One day I hope to go back to Kikoi because Kikoi is gendered male, at least so far. Um, now, as young women, we began wearing, okay, younger. Now I'm not as young as I used to be. But we wear, we wear Kikois. I want to find out if there is a meaning in the patterns and so on of Kikois. I don't know. But yes, I'm an unapologetic about being a gendered text. But I think even in that, there is space for men to come back in. Don't worry, we're not leaving you out. Two-third gender rule. Women are very good about obeying the two-third gender rule. It's the men who struggle with this. The question of, so I love the fact that Leso are so ambiguous. Because as somebody said, even something that seems to be so straightforward, this one is mungu ni mweza wayote. Is, why is somebody wearing it in a particular context? Are they going through a difficult situation and they're actually questioning this? Is God truly the one who has, is able to do this? Am I wearing it because I want to affirm it to someone? Am I wearing it because my neighbor is trying to frustrate my plans? So when I wear it, I'm telling them, yeah, you do what you want to do, but God is the one who's going to fight for me, so to speak. If Anjeri appears tomorrow in court and has that lesson, she's telling us something, right? So I love the fact that it's ambiguous. And people, in fact, there's a, an article, Ambiguous Science, by I think that would be Beck, where she talks about the fact that for many women, it is the fact that I wear this lesson in a public space and people are not quite sure whether or not I'm communicating to them. So I want to pick a fight with my supervisor because he's late with my dissertation and um, response, but I can't tell him directly. If I read the lesson, he reads it and he thinks, well, 
that one of something about somebody being late, but he can't, he can't, he can't, he can't say, hey, why are you dissing me? I like the fact that I can wear the same lesso in 10 different um, occasions and it's ambiguous. So for historians, I hate to disabuse you of the notion that much as I have said it, lessons are not just for you. Remember I talked about versatility. So some lessons will be useful. In fact, one of the categories I look at in the second part is there are lessons that are used to document history. So something has happened. Uh, by Barack Obama existed, you can still buy lessons. My favorite, Michael Jackson died, lessons appeared. Right? Um, independence. I'm hoping we'll have Kenya at 60. The fact that I haven't yet seen any King Charles lessons tells me what we think about the historical import of his visit in Kenya. Maybe they're still coming. I have a lesson I should have brought. It's another of my favorite because it's a mistake lesson. When Pope John Hall, no, sorry, when Pope Francis came to Kenya, has Pope Francis come? Which one came? Yeah, Pope Francis. No, no, not that one. The one, the latest one. It was John Paul. Francis. When Pope Francis came, there's a lesson that was um, produced. The person I usually buy lessons at Harriers. Then many, he just told me, I don't know why these lessons are not moving. So he actually gave it to me as a gift because I buy it so much. And I thank Harriers because I bought many lessons and they know a lot about Kanga history. I took it home. I took a picture. I sent it to my friend Yvonne. Yvonne immediately responds and says, that's not Pope Francis. I'm like, what? She says, that's Pope Don before Benedict. Benedict. I say, no. I check with another Catholic and they say, that's Pope Benedict. I should have brought it. That's why Catholics were not buying it. It was the wrong Pope. I'm sure one day those will be collector's items, right? So the historians, for historians, it would be great to just go even to these Kanga shops because many of them keep the designs and look at how they, which, what is it that people think is worth documenting. Mm -hmm. I was in Dar es Salaam and they were telling me people are still producing Magafuli Kangas to this day, which talks to you about the import because you can find Magafuli Kangas all over. You can barely find Kikwete or Mkapa. I haven't seen those ones. You can also find Mama Samias, by the way. But then my question is, after a new president comes in, in Tanzania, would we find Mama Samia? Are there Ruto Kangas? I don't know. Are there Uhuru Kangas? I don't know. Right, But yes, there's a space for a particular kind of kanga to do documentation. And then the question of abstract motifs. Now, this is where archaeology for me is interesting. It suggests something. I cannot, I cannot speak definitively. Um, in performance, we have a notion. So Margaret Drewell, whom I cited earlier, and who was my dissertation supervisor, did has done a lot of the path-breaking work on performance in Africa. And one of the notions that she really runs with is you see a lot of repetition with a significant difference, which is something that um, we do in Kanga, where you see the same design like this one is coming back, but what they change is the wording. And I think for me, what is interesting is to ask which motifs have remained and people keep using and which ones have disappeared. And what does it mean that a lot of our younger Kanga designers, I've talked to a couple of them, are designing Kangas, they're using abstract, they really go abstract, and then they, um, a couple I've talked to say, I didn't even know those motifs had a meaning, right? In Tanzania, the Kanga design, and my friend Diana has done, is doing a lot of work on that. Um, people are learning the design, they're learning the motifs, they're learning the patterns, they have names for them, they're passing that down. Um, the people I've talked to here are telling me Kanga design is not really being taught in Kenyan um, art schools. And where it is being taught, the emphasis is on making it look nice and not on recovering the significance of this. So one of the things I'm hoping is at some point to look at uh, work with people like Bifa, um, Buruburu Institute of Fine Art, to work with the fine art schools in the universities and also in school, the art curriculum, to see if Kanga design can be taught, but more meaningful. Yeah. Okay, one of my favorite proverbs that I saw in Kanga was Mungu Shia Atumani. And I've always wondered who Atumani is. I wondered why they didn't say Mungu Shia Kimingichi. Uh, now, uh, 
we will have some people on, uh, online. Men's short, short. Okay, seems uh, uh, Prof uh, Kukubo can't hear me. Can I can hear you now. I can hear you now. You are off for a while. Sorry. Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, can I go ahead? Can you hear me? Maybe I should go ahead and say what I want to say because I can't hear you, but if you can hear me, I'll go ahead. Okay, uh, I have got um, a comment to make. And first of all, to thank uh, Dr. Mongola for that excellent presentation. Uh, my comment is on a more recent history, relatively, and it has to do with the word Makanga. Uh, Makanga, uh, my knowledge of it is that uh, it originated about 1925 to 1935, where the colonial adventurers were moving around in their new cars, Model T, when the motor vehicle was quite new, and they needed to have um, the natives intimidated off the road. So they had young men who ran by the side of the car, and the Memsa Hibs were not quite happy with that, because as they ran by the side of the car and they were naked, they tended to bob around. So uh, it was uh, suggested by the ladies that uh, a plain color kanga should be bought for them. So Maradufu kangas were purchased in Mombasa and given as uh, a dress for these men. And then sooner or later, it was decided these fellows would make the first uh, lot of people in the Kenya police for the natives. So the first uh, Kenya police uniform was a kanga in Maradufu. And uh, uh, after Second World War, uh, it ran out of fashion, and then they became Askari Kanga. And uh, in my family, we had one person who was an Askari Kanga, and so the name stuck, he was called Kanga. So uh, one gentleman I know, a former provincial commissioner, John Nandasava, is called Kanga because he was named after an Askari Kanga. Now, this um, uh, Makanga found their way later on into bus stops once the Kenya police, after, uh, the administration police took over. So that is my comment. Perhaps it might make sense there are no designs, there's no further history, just Makanga. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that Thank rich for history. That rich history. Very really benefited from it. I don't know whether Professor Raya is around. I saw her earlier. Would you like to say something, Prof? Uh, thank you, Kimengiti. Um, I want to congratulate um, uh, Dr. Mshai first for the very good presentation. But I, I just wanted to add something that uh, Swahili men also communicate using the lesson. When they buy those tangas, if they want to pass a message to the wife and they don't want to, uh, maybe they, if she confronts the wife, they might quarrel. So they buy a kanga with a name with a message which will tell the wife what she has done that is one two swahili men wear kangas but they wear them only in the bedroom that's why you see they are cut into two pieces so if they wrap themselves like a kikoi but it is only inside the house even outside the bedroom if there are other people he will not parade around in a kanga it is only in the bedroom or in the house if there are the only two of them. Swahili women use it as a way of uh, keeping the man inside the house. 
once he's inside the house and he puts on the kanga, he cannot go out with the kanga. Huh? So he will just be inside. For, for, for us women, we also use it as a way of ensuring he's just inside the house. Thank you. Why am I beginning to associate kanga, men and kanga with cowardice? <laughs> if, if you can't talk, you buy a kanga. If you don't want to leave the house, or <laughs> the ones who remain in the house are the ones in Kanga. <laughs> I don't know whether there's anyone. Edward, uh, Edward, uh, Dr. Ari Edward, you are turned. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? I'm sure you can hear me. Thank you so much, Dr. Mshai, for to hear you presenting. I'm not a historian, no, an, 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 an artist. Come from a business dimension. The last two years I've been very keen about globalization. And as you're talking about the Kanga, I'm wondering whether cloth wears off easily. So I'm not sure whether any of you be in the museums. But as you do a, your second discourse on the political side, maybe extend it to the economic side. And that reminds me of the old Silk Road that was done a couple of centuries ago. And the recent creation of the Built and Road Initiative. Maybe if museums are able to keep this either as cloth uh, preserved or maybe as, 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 as pictures, they could give us a hint of what was being traded. I've been following a lot of trade, trade routes as I'm looking at globalization, and they could give us a, a, a link, a missing link in terms of the routes that were used in globalization. Uh, that, that's my, my comment and maybe a question. Well, I, I recall that after, after political discourse, Venging to the economic side of the of the of the Kanga. Maybe I don't know that would be 2029. 20, 20, Thank you. Osaji, do you have Osaji, a question? Do you have a question? Is there anyone in the audience here who has a burning question? Okay, now it doesn't have to be burning. <laughs> a comment? Okay. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, my name is Sarah Kerry. I am a former classmate of Mshai Kitambosana. Um, now about the kanga, I love kangas, but more than that, I'm finding that with this current um, curriculum. Oh, okay. Um, the CBC we are trying to go back to our roots. So I do know that children are being encouraged to wear traditional clothes on some days to show different cultures. Um, I have an eight-year-old grandson who I look after. And uh, sorry to announce this in public, but he loves kangas. He'll go and swim in a kanga. He'll walk to the bathroom in a kanga. He wears it Maasai style, one shoulder, and it hangs and everything hangs. But for, for him, He's also been very um, attracted to clothes made from kangas. And what attracts him most, apart from the design, the unique designs, is the words. What do those words mean? You know, sometimes it's um, a level of Kiswahili that he doesn't understand, but he's, he's really fascinated. And I think it's another way to really bring back our culture. I, I made a shirt for my 18-year-old son, and it's been hanging in the wardrobe for long, because an 18-year-old will not wear kanga. You know, but I discovered if I anchorize a shirt with Kanga, he's good to go. So let's go, Kanga. <laughs> That's very encouraging. I do that when I go to the coast. You cut a small piece, then you have a Kanga there. Uh, Mumia has said he just appreciates your presentation, has enjoyed it, doesn't have a question. Now, you can react to these last comments then we. Thank you very much. And actually, I'm so grateful to all the comments and questions because this is the point. The conversation is about people sharing stories, um, raising questions. When I do the workshops, we have the kangas all over the room and people bring their kangas and the stories are amazing. So I'm learning a lot. And the makanga is definitely now coming into the research as part of a story because that's hilarious, right? And when you think, I'm just thinking of the makanga that we have, maybe that uniform should now be taken back to kanga. <laughs> um, thank you again, Prof. So Prof um, Timami, 
um, the, her work is amazing. Uh, when you look at, you know, she looks really at Kanga in Swahili culture. And so, Prof, thank you again for your work and because I use it a lot. And the second part is a lot of it is based on Prof's Kanga work. I work with Leso. And yes, I encourage you, gentlemen, do not feel disheartened. There's a space for you in Kanga, right? It's just that we may look at it. One of the things that Yvonne does really well in the in less there's a, a story I perform again from Dragonfly C that I call Lesser Lessons. So the two I use Lesser Lessons and the Ziwaku. And in it, it shows the role of the of the seller. So if you go in the coast and you're buying Leso, it's the most you can go to them and tell them, I need a Leso for this occasion. And they know their Lessos and they will advise you. And not only they, other people in the shop will come and start saying, hey, if it is for this, use it for this. And so she's, she, she, she fictionalizes that in a really beautiful way um, in the story of a woman who needs to talk back to her community. Let me encourage you. The good thing is, even when, you know, in Nairobi, people just look at you. You ask me to tell you what that Swahili word means. I have no idea what it means or the other, um, the nuances behind it. But you can Google Right. Sometimes you'll actually find the phrase. Sometimes you'll be able to use the Swahili. Actually, we started and I want to thank my sister, if I can say this before we started, if you don't mind me using that example, she came in and she had a picture on her phone and she said, this is a kanga I have. But the words are the words that eh, I'm thinking about. What do they mean? So we were talking about it with Molly Mugonda and we were actually um, outsourcing to some Swahili scholars. So we hope we'll have that answer before we go. My quick story, my mother once gave me a lesson and I'll never forget. Those of you who know me know, I, and you can, you can imagine I'm talkative. My dad used to call me a chatterbox. I talk all the time. And my mom gave me a lesson that said, um, I was like, what? Mom, like really? And then she said, no, 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 no. What happened is that there's somebody who needed some money. She needed to be helped out. She's a trader. And she told me, you know, I bought these lessons bulk, you know, in Arusha, and I hadn't looked at the words. So when I came back home and I looked through them, this lesson I cannot wear in front of anybody because people will think I'm dissing them and nobody will buy it. So I'm giving it to you. If you don't mind, you buy it because you know the circumstances. So mom says she bought it. And then she thought she can't wear it <laughs> in front of anyone. So she said, but you, you know, you where you are, nobody will notice. So I took the lesson. But that thing disturbed me for a very long time. <laughs> and to this day, I don't know if my mother was sending me a message, like, be careful. <laughs> but you see, she was doing it in a polite way, which is the whole thing about, again, I'm going back to the way that this thing that Prof said about being able to message. One of the things I do with the lesser workshop, when it's an extended workshop, we start with lesser design and people just learn the basics. And then at a part, um, the middle section of it is people do a lesson that has a meaning to somebody, something that you're holding in your heart. And it could they could use symbols or they could use words. And then the third part of it is we divide people into a group and they take a conflict. Israel-Palestine. You guys are Israel, you guys are Palestine. Design a kanga that sends a message to the other side. Then that side takes your kanga and they respond to it. And we talk about how kanga can be used to mediate conflict without people coming to blows. Because in the time it takes you to design that kanga, your anger has gone down, right? And then, you know, you've read their symbols, you've decoded, you've given them a message, and then we tell them, use proverbs, use whatever, then it goes back. And there's a lot of talking that happens, right? So I'm, I'm thinking of... Um, Sarah, Sarah, I didn't want to call you out, you and um, Jerry, but you guys have shown yourselves. When I was, this is why you brought back memories of Mrs. Karanja and all our teachers, because you're right in front of me. But I think you have a point on this thing of CBC. How do we think about curriculum in a way that teaching children about identity is not just something they perform one day, you know, one day in a year, we're wearing our culture. And then, you know, a child comes and says, I have no idea what Taita culture looks like. Mom, help, help, help. But in a way that's meaningful. And then how do we take it to the next generation? Because there are young designers, and I've heard this from guys who tell me, 
after this workshop, I want to wear a kanga, but now would people laugh at me? And I'm saying, look, within a particular culture, you can't wear kangas. But how many young men will tell me that when they went for their rites of passage initiation, how many of you have worn less so? Let's be honest. Isn't that what most young boys wear until they, until they heal, right? Go to some of our communities, the Samburu, up north. People wear men. Men wear less so. So it's asking the context. And I think it should be okay for us to allow young men to wear less so, but to ask about how they're using it and where they're wearing it and what the symbols are saying. I had a lady who came to me in a workshop. She, she's the one person who came in with no lesson. And she said she was dragged there by her friend. Some of you know how that happens. And she said, I can't stand kangas. And I really didn't want to come. And I asked her why. And she said, it is because as a child, she one day wore a kanga. Her grandmother came. Her grandmother ripped the kanga from her body and said, what, and asked her mother, what is this that this girl is wearing? And so from then on, and she said, you know, I've been sitting as the workshop is going on. Everybody's having fun. And it's, it's like trauma. You've taken me back to this moment. And I've realized why. And I said, I, 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 why did she, did she tell you why? And she said, no, she just ripped it off and she told my mom off. So we continue. And, you know, this is a point where people walk around and they talk about their best designs. And she came to, you know, when I said this one, and I talked about it being fertility. And she said, that was it. She says, I remember that lesson. It had a big, one of these big in the middle. And when I said women use it to call, <laughs> to call infertility. So you use it when you're cultivating your garden because you want, you know, you want your garden to be fertile. You give it a lot of lessons on marriage. We'll have that. Um, you give it to young women hoping they'll, you know, you're calling in babies. And her grandmother, now we don't know this for sure because her grandmother has since died and her mother has since passed away. But we thought that maybe her grandmother was saying that a young girl has no business wearing a lesso that is calling a baby in before she's married. At least that's how we interpreted it to give her the permission to now start wearing lesso again. So I want to thank everybody, the examples you've given. Um, Dr. Kobudi, I believe, asked about globalization about museums. Museums have had kanga exhibitions in the past. I would love them to have a permanent exhibition because I think it's one of those exhibitions that would keep giving. The political economy um, part of it, just to say something small about it, is designed to getting us to think about our place as a region. Some of you may know that we signed an agreement with AGOA that um, has killed, has, has continued to keep our textile industry, right, from thriving. Less so, um, textiles in Kenya as a production died during the structural adjustment period. That's when Kikomi died, that's when Rivertex died, that's when all of that died. East African community signed an agreement. All the countries are supposed to enter into agreement to protect our textile industry. America came and said, oh, no, you don't. If you do that, we'll throw you out of Agoa. The only country that stayed to that was Rwanda. Rwanda said, fine, come and buy any, buy. The rest of us said, oops, we can't afford to offend America. So we said, okay, let that one stay. Uganda has recently been thrown out of Agoa. My prediction, hopefully, is that East Africa will develop the courage to say we need to protect our textile industry. You remember last year or during the campaigns, this whole conversation on Mitumba, right? I said we were the center of the world, bringing their best cotton to us. Today, we're the dumping ground of Western textiles. Why? So for me, it's a political stand. And I apologize to historians who only want us to enjoy history. I'm heading into politics, into policy, because we must understand the political economy of Kanga. Believe you me, if today all the Kangas that Kenya was consuming, even just 50%, even 60, 75%, if the East African region was making 75% of our Kanga output, our textile industry would be thriving. Today, we are importing almost 90% of our Kangas from India. And remember I told you, Bombay began as a manufacturing zone because they were producing textiles 
for us. There's a book I have cited. It's one of the last ones I cited. The person who started, one of the scholars who started it, started that research because there's a street in her city where all the factories are manufacturing kanga for the Eastern African market. Why? I have no issues with us keeping a vibrant relationship with India in terms, we've got a long history, but what is it costing us to continue importing cloth at the expense of our own industries? And then we are importing 90%, um, 80%, 70%, something like that of what we import in the Mitumba trade. I've got nothing against Mitumba but 70% and above of what we import ends up in landfill, which then becomes a, a, an environmental concern. So yes, I start with pottery and designs, but we're ending in policy and politics, global politics, because that's where we have to take. This is what, this is the joy of history for me. History is amazing. It wakes us up to who we have been, and then it inspires us to who we can become. And for that, I'm grateful to history and archaeology. Thank you. Yes. She is close to it, the remembering bit that we've been uh, emphasizing. No. <laughs> um, OK, I shall try. Since Yeah, since we have gone into, into political economy of the Kanga, which is the next, there is questions about intellectual property. And for me, there are lines between com community property. I mean, we are in a situation where, what, what are they called? The ones that do the Lion King can, can think they can patent Hakuna Matata. This is communal property. When you go into that trading world, how, how do we guard the lines between community property and trade. Thank you. So are we moving towards closing uh, session? Uh, want, uh, she's a performance studies scholar. I wanted to leave her with one question. Like it seems like in my community, which we have just mentioned, that when we are circumcised, you walk around with a lesser, you can tie a lesser. And uh, then we have mentioned lessers only being used in the bedroom. I'm wondering whether it is only used by men in liminal spaces. Uh, so perhaps that's a conversation we can have. Uh, 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 yes, um, this has been a very exciting session. Uh, that's why I know for sure now that we'll move to messaging, which the more familiar aspect for historians, I guess, uh, archaeologists who are looking at patterns and also closer to us from performance point of view. And I'm sure that day we will fill this place. Really, I invited some of my master's students to just look at how performance can unfold or come out in different ways. Uh, let's give a hearty clap for Dr. Mshai, thank you very much for making this session interesting and for making my work easy. Now, <laughs> we, we weren't lucky uh, to have our chair at the beginning of uh, the session. I pretended to be a historian, but it's only fair. <laughs> it's only fair that I don't put on a kanga in someone's house. So <laughs> uh, let me allow the chair to come and close this session officially. Uh, th thank you, Kim. Um, very soon we want to bring you to the department. Just wait. Uh, there are good things that happen here, as you can see. Now, um, you, you know, I as uh, Mushai talked, I, I remembered uh, an incident in my life. Um, at some point in uh, my life as I was growing up, and according to my parents and people around me and in our village, it took me too long to identify a descendant of Eve who can actually be the love of my heart. And um, 
I remember particular occasions when one of my aunties, because I, I used to behave a bit too religious, you know, you behave like you are closer to God than anybody around you. And uh, I, I didn't have much to do with ladies. So one of my aunties uh, uh, used to wear a kanga uh, written at the back, wasichana ni wamungu pia. Uh, you know, uh, uh, women are gods also. I, I didn't realize, it's now that I'm realizing that communication was meant for me. <laughs> so thanks, Michelle. You, you, have helped. You, you have helped some of us. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks, everybody, those online and uh, those on site. I saw quite a few of our senior colleagues online. Of course, Professor Raya Timami, uh, Professor Gukuba, and many others. Uh, we appreciate your company and all the colleagues here and, and those uh, who are our guests. Uh, we continue with this uh, conversation of bringing history, down, history and archaeology down from the Ivory Tower. Uh, next Thursday, uh, we are having one of our MA students, uh, which is a rare case. This is really going down. We have not had um, an MA student uh, presenting uh, in any of our series before, but now we want to bring it down deliberately. Uh, Alex Mokaya Umbane will be speaking on um, condemned uh, at birth, condemned at birth, narration from children with albinism. Yes. That's uh, what we are going to talk about. I think he is going to be the first of our MA students to speak in this forum. Uh, commonly, we have PhD students from here and from without, uh, but we are coming down to be more inclusive. So we look forward to seeing you next week, next Thursday, same place, on site, online. Thanks and God bless all of you. Thank you. Same, same time, 2.30 p.m. sharp. Today we were late for five minutes only, and, and we are finished late uh, because the discussion has been very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody. We don't have tea because the restaurant is very far. We'll do that next time. <laughs> Number of people you have.